I want to welcome you to today's Schiller Institute Conference. Let us create a new, more human epoch for mankind. Everyone here knows that this is an occasion which is momentous and historic. And everyone here knows that the guiding inspiration for many of us of our actions and in some cases our lives, Lyndon LaRouche is no longer physically here with us. Um, we have a quote which is on the back of your program. I only want to refer to the first sentence of it, which I'll read, which is from Lyndon LaRouche from January 19th of 2004, a speech he gave on the occasion of Martin Luther King's birthday weekend. And he said, we're all mortal, and to arouse in us the passions while we're alive, which will impel us to do good, we have to have a sense that our life and the consuming of our life, the spending of our talents, is going to mean something for coming generations. The best people look for things like Moses that are going to happen when he will no longer be around to enjoy them. When it comes to the issue of coming generations, of what he called economic forecasting also, there's no one from the standpoint of simple documented historical record who was able to accomplish what Lyndon LaRouche did both in that field and more importantly in the field of human creativity. I am always honored on all occasions to introduce the person who founded the Schiller Institute and I'm particularly honored on this occasion to introduce her, and that is Helga Zepp LaRouche. Helga. rather than attempt to say anything more than that welcome could say, we will um, instead allow Lyndon LaRouche to speak for himself, which he was very fond and capable of doing. <laughs> um, I mentioned economic forecasting. On July 22, 2007, a year before the world would hear about the necessity for a $880 billion and then a several trillions dollar and then a $16.7 trillion and then who knows how many trillions dollar bailout. Before the world would hear about that, Lyndon LaRouche gave a, a speech and we're going to play an excerpt from that now. It occurs at a time where the world monetary financial system is actually now currently in the process of disintegrating. Nothing mysterious about this. I've talked about it for some time. It's been in progress. It's not abating. What's listed as stock values and market values in the financial markets internationally is bunk. These are purely fictitious beliefs. There's no truth to it. The fakery is enormous. There is no possibility of a non-collapse of the present financial system. None. It's finished now. 
the present financial system cannot continue to exist under any circumstances, under any presidency, under any leadership, or any leadership of nations. Only a fundamental and sudden change in the world monetary financial system will prevent a general, immediate, chain reaction type of collapse. At what speed, we don't know, but they will go on and it will be unstoppable. The, one of the most startling of his forecasts occurred uh, in a combination of both a press conference that he gave, Helga was present for this, October 12th, 1988, at the Kempinski Hotel in Berlin, where Mr. LaRouche asserted that the time had come for the reunification of Germany. This is one year before the fall of the Berlin Wall. All of us who were around at that time, who are honest, will admit that we had no idea what he was actually talking about. <laughs> and one year later, it occurred. Could we show? Under the proper conditions, many today will agree that the time has come for early steps toward the reunification of Germany, with the obvious prospect that Berlin might resume its role as the nation's capital. For the United States, as for Germans and Europe generally, the question is, will this reunification process be brought about by assimilating the Federal Republic into the East Bloc's economy or economic range of influence? Or can it be accomplished in a different way? In other words, is a united Germany to come into being as a part of Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals, as President de Gaulle proposed, or as Mr. Gorbachev has desired, a Europe from the Urals to the Atlantic? I see the possibility that the process of unification could occur precisely as de Gaulle proposed. I base this possibility on the reality of a terrible worldwide food crisis which has erupted during the past several months and which will dominate the world's politics in every part of the world for at least two years to come. The economy of the Soviet bloc itself is a terrible and worsening failure. In Western European culture, we have demonstrated that the successes of nations of big industries depends upon the technologically progressive independent farmer and what is called here in Germany the Mittelstand. Soviet culture in its present form is not capable of applying this lesson. Despite all attempts at structural reform and despite any amount of credit supplied by the foolish West, the Soviet bloc economy as a whole has reached the critical point. At its present time, in its present form, it will continue to slide downhill from here on even if the present worldwide food crisis had not come into being. I do not foresee the possibility of genuine peace between the United States and Soviet Union earlier than 30 to 40 years from now. The best we can do in the meantime, in the name of peace, is to avoid a new general war among the major powers. This war avoidance must be based partly upon armed strength and our political will. It must be based also on rebuilding the strength of our economies. At the same time that we discourage Moscow from dangerous military and similar adventures, we must heed the lesson taught to us by a great military scientist from about 400 years ago, Nicola Machiavelli. We must always provide our adversary with a safe route of escape. We must rebuild our economies to the level at which we can provide the nations of the Soviet bloc an escape from the terrible and worsening effects of their economic suffering. On November 9th, the Berlin Wall fell one year later. In no on November 10th, approximately November 10th, from jail, where he was incarcerated unjustly, Lyndon LaRouche began to formulate a plan which went through various stages, 
first referred to as the European Triangle, later referred to as the New Silk Road, and then later referred to as the Eurasian Land Bridge and ultimately the World Land Bridge. And that began a dialogue which happened, which was carried out, spearheaded by Helga with the nations of Russia, China, and many of the nations of the former East Bloc. But that vision that Lyndon LaRouche had at that time had already been preceded by much earlier discussions. We are all very uh, dramatically impressed and, and, and grateful for what was done by the nation of China in lifting 700 million people out of poverty. We're going to play for you now something that Lyndon LaRouche discussed with his organization at the time that he initiated his first campaign for the presidency, for the Democratic nomination for the presidency in 1978. And on that occasion, he defined an idea that later on we were referred to as, as a new economic platform. But he defined a task for America and for Americans that he wanted his presidency to initiate. So can we play? What are we going to do? We're going to build new places. We lay it out to us. How do you build a new place? Well, you go out and you dig a big crater. <laughs> you lay a big footing, unless you've got bedrock, which even that up. You don't even care what the terrain is like. It makes no difference. Wherever you are, blast it out, build a crater. <laughs> build a crater covering an area the size of a city, a city of a half million people or a hundred thousand people, but build a crater for an industrial city of a new type on an area of that size. All right, six, seven, eight stories below the surface. Build it up. Build up to the surface. On this thing, stick two nuclear plants, half gigawatt to two gigawatts each. You get a balanced load. String industries around this, using this energy to cut low distribution costs, like charm bracelets. Well, let's put a chemical industry here. That's the good thing. Let's have desalination here, so forth. Using the waste heat and the electrical power. Build housing for the families, modern housing, housing to last 100 years. For the families of the people who are going to be brought in to do the construction, which will be done, completed within a period of four to six years. Build the on-site cultural ed program, schools, universities, technical schools, everything that a city requires. And when the project is completed, the end of six years, these people occupy the factories because they've been educated. And gradually, the Europeans and others who have been phased in phase out, except for a few key technicians. The city then is built. It's modular. You can change it. You can develop it with no big cost. Its transportation systems are built in and modular for, for the next 100 years for any technological improvements which will be significant in the next 100 years. The city functions, city builds. Now, four to six years, we're going to build hundreds of these in the next 25 years. Hundreds of them. Hundreds of new cities throughout the world, especially in the developing sector. These cities will be linked together. They will form a network of high technology culture, planted in the middle of the other rest of the population. And from these cities and through these cities and their universities and technical schools and technical services to the surrounding area, we will lift one generation of the human race up from barbarism and oppression into modern life. And it would, in the next 25 years following that, we'll complete the job. And within 50 years from now, the human race will be transformed as we city builders intend to do it. We are going to mobilize every industry that exists that's viable and everyone that can be created to do this. 
We're not going to export a few 10, 20 billion dollars worth of additional exports. We're going to export hundreds of cities. That is a vision of a poet. Uh, Lyndon LaRouche introduced many of us to what you're about to hear, and this is uh, his reading of a section from Percy Shelley's Defense of Poetry. During a period of reaction which occurred among British intellectuals in the wake of the French Revolution, there was an attempt to explain creativity and art as being something which occurred within art itself as independent of political movements of that time. In rebuttal of this, uh, Shelley wrote an essay, one of his several important essays, and I'll refer to another one later tonight, entitled In Defense of Poetry. And I shall read a section from the conclusion of that which is a thesis from which we shall work to provide a setting for the purpose of this program. The literature of England, an energetic development of which has ever preceded or accompanied a great and free development of the national will, has arisen, as it were, from a new birth. In spite of the low-thoughted envy which would undervalue contemporary merit, our own will be a memorable age in intellectual achievements. And we live among such philosophers and poets as surpass beyond comparison any who have appeared since the last national struggle for civil and religious liberty. The most unfailing herald, companion, and follower of the awakening of a great people to work a beneficial change in opinion or institution is poetry. In such periods, there is an accumulation of the power of communicating and receiving intense and impassioned conceptions respecting man and nature. The persons in whom this power resides may often, as far as regards many portions of their nature, have little apparent correspondence with that spirit of good of which they are the ministers. But even whilst they deny and abjure, they are yet compelled to serve the power which is seated on the throne of their own soul. It is impossible to read the compositions of the most celebrated writers of the present day without being startled with the electric life which burns within their words. They measure the circumference and sound the depths of human nature with a comprehensive and all-penetrating spirit. And they are themselves perhaps the most sincerely astonished at its manifestations, for it is less their spirit than the spirit of the age. Many of us had the privilege of meeting Lyndon LaRouche back in the 1970s. I met him first in December of 1970 at Columbia University. And uh, some of us were rash enough to think that we could master what he knew in a period of a few months, or maybe everybody wasn't like that. I was less like that. <laughs> Forty years later, the one thing that you had learned was that that was probably not going to happen. At the age of 90, uh, Lynn uh, gave a, a talk in Europe. And I want to point out that while we say he is a poet, and that's certainly true, Lynn was always, shall we say, very frank about his view of circumstances, politics, and people. And I think we should play the next excerpt. Without Glass-Steagall, right now, civilization is dead. It cannot survive. But what, what's, what does all this mean? I said, first of all, I'll tell you two things. One, all life is based on an evolutionary process onto which species go from lower qualities of development to higher. That's the animal kingdom. That's the law of evolution. Now, mankind is different than all other kinds of animals because mankind has the power to evolve voluntarily. Mankind evolves voluntarily not by changing its biology, but by changing its mind. 
and the utilization of the noetic powers of mind. And no, no animal species has really noetic powers of mind. Only human beings have noetic powers of mind. And therefore, the object is always to go to higher levels of technology, which means kill off the green policy. If you want to survive, end the green policy, because that's a death sentence. It's a suicide pract. Mankind must always progress. We must always d d learn from the animals and apply the principles the animals don't know how to do. Yeah. Rise to a higher energy flux density. And how do you do that? You make physical discoveries. You go from lower forms of, of energy to flux density to higher forms of energy flux density. You find new applications. Now mankind is, for the moment, helpless against the asteroids, which are arrayed against us inside the solar system. We're helpless against the comets. We saw recently in, in Russia, we saw some quick, quickie comets shooting through there. If they've had a little more energy flux density in that territory, you wouldn't have had, say, a, a, a large number of people injured. You would have had mass deaths. Mankind is faced with mass death. If we fail to progress adequately and rapidly enough in order to defeat the problems. Now, in the, United, in the United States and in Europe, you have a common suicide pact. It's called the Green Policy, which is a species suicide pact. It's mass death without increase of the energy flux density expressed in terms of technology and, and pure power as such, there's no future for mankind on this planet. So Lyndon LaRouche, you would think with these kinds of ideas would be a loved figure. <laughs> Why was that not the case? In the final concluding uh, excerpt from him, I think you're going to hear why. He was a, almost from birth, enemy of, well, it had many forms, many names, British oligarchy, so forth, but it was really stupidity. He just, from birth, virtually from birth, and he believed that stupidity was not an excuse. Let's hear our final. The organization having achieved a certain level of development and the world requiring certain things from the organization, the organization could continue to grow. It should never stop. Anytime the organization finds no new thing to shock it, that it has yet to learn, then creativity has stopped. Creativity is not a voluntary thing. Oh, I want to be creative today. It's not like that. It's a way of life. It says, I'm not a cow. I can never reach a level at which I want to forever thereafter squat with the same level of understanding and achievement that I've achieved now. There is no point in the evolution of progress in which I want to stop. If I have completed the ascent from some kind of globadarinian creature, to a cow, I'm not going to say, now I am a cow. <laughs> I have reached a level of perfection so far above the Globigerina that I don't want to stop. I don't want to go any further. <laughs> I want to sit here and chew my cut and contemplate what I have achieved. <laughs> now, that's not life. Life goes on. If I can become this, I can become something more. It is necessary. There's no limit. There's never an end. If there's an end to new things to be conquered, new things to be mastered, new changes in the sense of advances in humanity, humanity ends. It goes off the cliff. It's all over. Humanity is not a cow. It is not a horse. It is not chickens. It is not some creature which is fixed by nature to do the same thing as its grandfathers and great-grandfathers. That's alien to humanity. If my great-grandfather did it, I shouldn't do it. 
because all I'm doing is repeating his life rather than using his life as a foundation for advancing further. Therefore, by repeating his life, I make his life boring and meaningless. By using his contributions to continue the process of human advancement, which he in his turn furthered, I give meaning to his life by not reliving it. If I relive his life, then I turn his life into a bad play without meaning. Creativity is a way of life. And so I'd just like to say on behalf, I think, of all of us and much of the rest of humanity, thank you, Lyndon LaRouche. Our keynote today is going to be given by Jacques Cheminade. Helga has asked me to simply say that she will be saying things during the course of the conference and will give keynotes on other occasions. Uh, and I don't think any of us have any question as to why. That's certainly her prerogative. So, uh, Jacques, president of Solidarity and Progress, as I'll say it in English, has been a long, long time associate of Lyndon LaRouche and his a nemesis of the French ideology in all of its forms <laughs> and of oligarchism. And I think what we'll do is we'll combine the titles the coming world of Lyndon LaRouche, can humanity govern itself to guarantee our existence as a species? John. It is for me great honor to be here this morning to speak here about the coming world of Lyndon LaRouche, especially after having heard him so alive. And much more than a great honor, an immense joy. Joy not only to be here among you in the United States, but the true joy of life. As Lyndon LaRouche told us in 1988, such that if we work to cut short at any point our mortal life by spending it in a way which ensures the cause of those hundreds of billions of souls yet to be born, we could walk to death with joy because we had completed our life, fulfilled it. The true joy to be a real human being among true human beings. El Gazep LaRouche, Lyndon's LaRouche wife and heir, challenges us today. It is now up to us to realize his life's work. Looking at all of us here, I see us with the eyes of the present, with all our imperfections in this terrible moment of humanity. But I see us with the eyes of the future, I am filled with hope because our lives are shaped by the history of an organization which has always thought and fought to be at the forefront. Hope beyond pain and sorrow, hope across the boundaries of nations and time. It is with confidence in what we will accomplish, mustering the strength of fight to fight and win. It is with confidence that I see the coming world as a world of Lyndon LaRouche. We have before 
us the possibility of a paradigm change, freeing the world from the destructive grip of the British Empire and its ideology. But it will happen only if all of us become guiding lights ahead of what we are and not followers of easy path. So let's do it. Let's do it because it is our mandate and mission. This conference, to make sense, has to be followed by an unprecedented political organizing to inspire minds, extend our hands to others beyond all parochialisms, personal biases, and borders. Our commitments, a new Bretton Woods, a national bank, public credit, the Glass-Steagall Act, and fusion energy are not mere words or recipes to be repeated, but powerful ideas defining a dynamic unity. If they do not become real, the world, as Lynn told us before, is doomed. The world is doomed. La Rousse's Four Laws will define the future of humanity if there is going to be one. It is as simple as that. And it is what should make us decide what we will do with our lives. What de Gaulle called at the liberation of Paris, our otherwise miserable and short lives. Not by adopting a set of, a set of cultish lifesavers, but as intervention in history which confronts our quality of being human. The human house, at the moment of the human house, is threatened both by financial tsunami and by the flames of war. At this point, even the director of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde, has warned that the world is at risk of an economic and financial tempest. Even the guardians of the financial temple feel themselves compared to one about what is going to happen. The statistics, which are the shadows on the wall of the cave, are clear. For 1% of gross national product increase generated by the economy, between 4 or 6% of debt have to be issued over the same gross national product. The conditions to reimburse that debt are obviously impossible to meet, obviously not met, and a default has been avoided until now only by pumping more and more liquidities into the system. Fake money is not fake news. <laughs> the situation is of the same type, but much worse than the one which had, we had just before the subprime crisis of 2007 and 2008, of which Lyndon LaRouche was the first political leader to warn. Today, even if the home buyers are in, bad, in a bad situation, in a bad situation once again, the center of the crisis is located in the so-called financial firms. Money has been lent to them, though they were in a bad shape. They are called, even between the guardians of the financial temple, they are called zombie firms. <laughs> if you have seen Hollywood movies, you see what it means. <laughs> they don't produce enough to pay even the interest of their debts. So they have no other possibility than to become predators, eating the flesh of the others. And that's a reality. The loans are agglomerated in the form of securities and were sold to the markets under the name of collateralized loan obligations, the famous CLOs. It is again a form of securitization backed not by real estate debts this time, like the subprimes, 
but by depths of middle-sized and large businesses pulled together and passed on to different classes of investors in various tranches. The wormy apples are therefore doomed to rot all the other apples just the same as with the subprimes. This global risk in the next years is estimated at an amount of at least $10 trillion. Not to speak about the students' debt, of which 20% here in the United States is actually or potentially in default, nor the debts of car purchasers, which are supposed to pay for their cars during lengths of time which are longer than the average expectancy, life expectancy of their cars, of their vehicles. These two debts represent more than $3 trillion. The world's global debt has reached more than $250 trillion, while the debt of derivative products, which are bets on future prices of all sorts of commodities and papers, this debt is estimated to be as 1.5 quadrillion dollars. It is obvious that such debt pyramid, mostly amounting to gambling debts, cannot and will not be reimbursed. Until now, this financial casino has not been closed down because all the gamblers have been provided with fake money. There comes the fake money. At zero, almost zero interest rates. But this easy money cannot find cannot continue to flow forever and will stop and has to stop indeed very soon. But if interest rates increase, borrowing will become too costly and the gamblers will be shuttled away, flushed away. And if interest rates remain at the present low rates, the benefits for lending will remain too low and the lenders will evaporate. It is a whole money system which is therefore sentenced to death. The American Federal Reserve, as well as European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan and the Bank of England, have put monetary fat in the balance sheets to the level of imploding them. But they can't reduce it because if they do it, all the gamblers will die of monetary starvation. <laughs> so they would rather maintain the gamblers and starve the rest, starve the world. It is in this context that the gamblers are betting on the ABIC, the big nanotechnologies, biotechnologies, information theory, and cognitive science investments. They are being, or they are betting, on their control over big data, which means trillions and quadrillions of data to control the economies and to control the people. They expect robots, computers, and associated artificial intelligence, which is no intelligence at all, they, they expect this to control the behavior of people through the monopolization of data and the pirating of our brains. <laughs> it's a world. Elon Musk, for example, is investing on computer interfaces which he hopes will change the way people think. The Silicon Valley hippies of the old days have become the auxiliaries of the present day mind controllers. So this gives a sense of what ecology means concretely. Is this thing serious? Well, obviously not. If human beings think and work as human beings. as creative human beings, which is our responsibility here. But I would answer rather yes, if human beings allow themselves to be controlled and are devoid of their capacity to create. I must warn you that that process has started. Their plan is to replace what they call useless social classes by more efficient new technologies which means that they consider a majority of human beings as being unable to perform creative tasks, or better said, they are confident that they can make them unable of performing creative tasks. In that context, the old, old Malthusian idea is making a great comeback 
in their dirty minds. Remember the times where George Bush was saying babies are the enemies. I remember this old issue of new solidarity. The question to the question, what are we going to do with the userless classes, the answer, three things. First, prevent them from successfully breeding population control, population destruction. Second, immerse them in an ocean of virtual experiences. If you don't believe what I'm saying, look at the majority of our kids spending more than five hours per day in front of their screens. And third, well, if the worst would come to worse, <coughs> viruses of wars will become necessary for them. If you don't believe me, there are hundreds of series of bizarre books available on this issue. For example, the present bestseller in France, I don't know here in the United States, is Yuval Noah Harari's Homo Deus, who like Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, pretends to denounce what he sarcastically describes, but which in fact he takes pleasure, he rejoiced in learning from his experimenters' friends. They are saying openly what they are doing secretly, and they are saying that through various storytellings that they are throwing on you and me. Behind this, we have the military complex, which is financial and not industrial, as Eisenhower said. It's a <clears throat> financial military complex. Eisenhower had warned about it in 1961, calling it industrial military, industrial economic complex. The Silicon Valley and other similar places throughout the world have been financed by the Pentagon or other military establishments to work on military applications. It is in US DARPA, DARPA is at the forefront of this, with other agencies of data control, such as the CIA founded Palantir, founded in 2004. Now it controls the whole float of Airbuses, for example. They had to give away their float to Palantir because only Palantir has the data. This is where the British project to control the applications of science is at its top. The data is shared among the five eyes Five Eyes Beast, United <laughs> Kingdom, USA, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, with France now playing a role of junior associated member through its knowledge on how to control the information going through submarine cables between France and African countries. So France has become their leg into Africa. A cyber war is already going which can degenerate at any time, mainly between the Five Eyes on the one hand and Russia and China in the other. There is a connecting point between the financial flows, which circulated at the speed of life through the cyber world, and the cyber war and the open war itself. It is the reason why the present situation is so dangerous. The British Empire and its Anglo-American form, you know, British brains and American muscle, is fully aware of its own weaknesses in the world to come, and is playing its last card in this domain. It is acting like a wounded tiger, this wounded tiger of the British narratives about the colonial universe, a wounded tiger which becomes a manhunter. It means control of communications and weapons on Earth and military control on the outer space. Donald Trump, whatever his flaws, does not come from that underworld of educated criminals. He, as a good business person, wants to reach peace in the world to make good deals. He is not ideologically flawed like the Wall Street city of London politicians. He utterly dislikes the war mongers of the CIA or the FBI. That's why the Anglo-American oligarchy wants to get rid of him and rid of his close friends as you may have seen in the last days. Either by direct political or even physical elimination, some of them have said it, or from inside by profiling and surrounding him with experts, counselor, 
from their own dirty world. Until now, Trump is doing pretty well. He's getting rid of the Russian gate. He has created a spirit of peace in Singapore. And now the American negotiation team in China is trying to complete a trade agreement between the two countries. Trump said that he might be flexible on the March 1st deadline for imposing tariffs on China if no deals has been reached by then. Thanks in part to our efforts, and in particular to Barbara Boyd's report on the legal assassin Robert Mueller, who was also the legal assassin of Lynn, American population smells that the operation to tumble Trump comes from no good people and beyond is targeting the American presidency as a power. It's even beyond Trump himself. Let's nonetheless consider all the sources of immediate danger. In the minds of some, the so-called trade war against China is aimed at becoming a technological cold war, preventing China to accomplish its Made in China 2025 high technology objectives. Moreover, US Secretary of State Mikhail Pompeo was in Poland where he raved against Russia's grand master plans for dominating Europe and reasserting its influence on the world stage. Before, at the NATO Defense Minister's Conference in Brussels and in Warsaw, he raved against Huawei and against the threat posed by Russia and China. Not exactly in conformity with Trump's call for peace through common development. And I mention Mikhail Pompeo and not Bolton and Navarro, because those are even worse. <laughs> those two are even worse. The Chinese react by stating, the US is lobbying all other NATO countries to stop using Huawei equipment with the obvious intention of making his allies participate in a crackdown of Chinese high-tech companies. If US allies stop using Huawei equipment, no longer purchase energy from Russia, and further alienate China and Russia as the demands of Washington while increasing imports from the US and following the US lead in everything, then NATO would start to resemble the old Warsaw Pact. This was said precisely while Pompeo was in Warsaw, and you have to understand it is Chinese irony. <laughs> Even worse, if the dismantling of all the international arrangements made during the Cold War to prevent an open military conflict. The United States withdrew from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, the ABM Treaty, in 2002, and has deployed those anti-missile weapons around the Russian borders in Europe, despite the fact that they had been promised at the fall of the Berlin Wall, of the Berlin Wall that NATO forces would only go in the former East Germany and not further. It has been acknowledged in the meantime that such anti-ballistic missiles can eventually, with the recent technological progress, be transformed into ballistic weapons. The US recently announced that it will leave the Intermediate Nuclear Forces, the INF Treaty, within six months if Russia did not destroy its 9M721 missile and associated systems. But in the meantime, the US itself is producing yield nuclear warheads like the W76-2 for the US Navy, for the US Navy's Trident submarine launched ballistic missile. As Boston-based journalist John Carroll said, it is not designed against another country launching its nukes. M mad, this is a mutual assault destruction. But this time, this is a weapon that can make the unthinkable thinkable. As for the START Treaty, there are no real signs of new negotiations from its third version or new START, beyond its third version of, new, of, uh, of the new START, which is going to end in 2021, February 2021. Adding to that, the intended militarization of outer space in contradiction with the spirit of the Demilitarization Treaty of 1967, if you add that, the conditions are met for an extremely dangerous situation. 
even more dangerous that under MAD, the Mutually Assured Destruction Treaty during the Cold War. The best experts consider that the world military situation is potentially even more dangerous today than under the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Now, in the present situation, the Western powers have dropped the international rule of non-intervention into the domestic affairs of other countries. The case of Venezuela is very dangerous, with Mexican President López Obrador having to remember to all others the principles of non-intervention, self-determination, and peaceful resolution of conflicts. This is not a matter of liking or not Maduro. Personally, I don't like him at all. But it's a question of international policy and the rules of international policy. The US Special Envoy to Venezuela is Elliot Abrams, and you know better than me what that means. He was an arch enemy of Lyndon LaRouche. In the case of Iran, with the rule, with the rule of US extraterritoriality, which makes the US hated in most of the world, with a US rule of extraterritoriality, which de facto prevents any country from trading with another one if the United States forbids it, the Iranian economy is strangled. The recession has reached there minus 4%, and the skilled young population entering the labor market cannot find jobs. Two points are worth considering here about Iran. First, Iran has never violated the nuclear treaty that it signed and is only being blamed for producing missiles that no treaty prevents them from building. Second, Iran's public debt is about 40% of the gross national product, while the French one is reaching 100% and the American is well over it. Speak about financial virtue? <laughs> and as far as virtue is concerned, Macron's France, who tries to give lessons to everybody, and that's why France is starting to be hated in the whole world, has not only promoted military interventions in Syria and Libya, not Macron himself, but France with Macron's, at the time, support, but now is interfering itself in the internal affairs of Venezuela. In this context, the European Union is in shambles in total disunity, it should be called the European disunity, with no political vision, no sense of the future, and no respect for national sovereignties. President Macron is speaking of European sovereignty, which obviously is a total illusion, because there is no such thing as a European people, as well as a chimera, since European, Europeanist leaders themselves do not hide from the people that for their good, they have to build Europe against them, against the people. They say it openly. Juncker said it openly, the president of the commission. A revealing aspect of the stage of things in the European Union is that its official statistic office ordered all state members to include in the calculation of their respective national gross products all possible trades, drug trade, human beings trade, weapons trade, a demand which is more and economically insane, criminal, absurd, but logical in a monetarist economy in which to reach a gross national product, you add all the added values independent of the effects other than money. Let's look now at the Chinese. Their representatives at the Davos summit were pretty blunt. I've gathered a few quotes to give you the sense of what is really going on as far as the sewers of our press are from reality. So this is reality, not the sewers of our press. And as far as the sewers of Twitter and Facebook are far from what Lyndon LaRouche is. So let's listen to those Chinese with this world of reality. And this is in Davos. It's in front of the whole managers of the Western world and the world elites. This is what they say. It's a discussion among two Chinese and two bankers. The recipe of Chinese policies is productivity, family values, savings orientation, and control of the financial system. The real question is not the level of debt, but how the credit is used and where it goes. 
China is ready to open up to the world. To open up is good for China. China is ready to play in the global economy. But the question is, is the world ready? <laughs> China is going to be the main source of added wealth for the world during many years. Therefore, the Chinese say, to launch a trade war against China may not be a very good idea. <laughs> the real debt problem is the American debt. The problem for the US is to sell its debt to the rest of the world when the Chinese are blamed to organize the debt of African countries or to have themselves a domestic debt which is very high. So this is what they say. The truth there was just said in a few words. So does this mean that the Chinese with a One Belt, One World initiative will be the solution to all our problems? Should Trump or Italy, Faradase, should they do it by themselves? There are two major opportunities. There are two major contributions. But of course, not the solution in itself. We have a great task before us, the most interesting of all tasks. With all those best possible allies, and considering that the key of the world direction lies presently here in the United States, our task is to be the of clearers, the pathfinders, for the coming La Rouge world. The first thing to remind the Americans, to remind the Americans of, is that the US economic system is a credit system based on the constitutional authorities of the government to issue and control its own money. As one of the advisors of both Charles de Gaulle and Pierre Mendes France, Georges Boris said, if the state doesn't control the money, it's the money that controls the state. The President of the United States should act upon the authority of federal law to utter currency as credit against the United States itself, betting not on the markets, but on the future of the nation and its people as a whole. The main function of this credit is to supply capital funds for long-term capital investments in the public sector and spilling it over in the private sector. To free us from the shackles of the British casino, we should separate banking activities, banning spe financial speculation from the state protection, and putting the existence system under bankruptcy reorganization. This is what Lyndon LaRouche repeated so many times, and that now, provided we fight for it, can become a reality with a financial collapse. Internationally, this means a cooperative set of treaty agreements between 25 and 50 year duration, as the Chinese government is doing with partner states to build the new Silk Roads. This is the way Roosevelt wanted to organize the world after World War II, a project sabotaged by the British and Truman. In the meantime, Churchill was delivering speeches in Europe, including the famous Westminster speech, where he openly described how Europe has to be put under control through financial liberalization and free trade. This is called by a friend of ours, the rape of Europe. It's the Anglo-American Zeus raping the poor European cow. Our La Rouge moment is to overcome this process of self-destruction and free ourselves to what is in fact a financial occupation. I have no time to stress how we should also free ourselves from the cultural occupation, which is the other leg of the financial one. I will always remember that day in my life when I heard Lin describing this as a double-pronged process, the financial looting and the countercultural destruction of the creative powers of human beings. The destruction of the creative powers through the sex, rock, drug counterculture of those times, which today has become incommensurably worse and so much more addictive. Remember Yuval Noah Harari, Noah, Yuval Noah Harari the author of Homo Deus, I quoted before. The aim is to emerge the useless classes 
in an ocean of virtual experiences in Japan and spreading to other countries, including here and in Europe, we have hikikomoris, what they call hikikomoris. I don't know if this word is familiar to you. These are young males who never leave their homes and their virtual universe with their computers. It is 20% of the Japanese youth. The financial and cultural occupations are based on the cult of entropy, the world doomed for destruction by today's catastrophists, which is the last straw of the Green New Deal. I met a person from the building where I stay in Paris who told me I'm desperate. The world is going into catastrophe. I dropped my job. I don't know what to do. It's terrible. So I asked him, what's terrible about it? It's a world is self-destroying. So I said, did you check who was destroying it, if there is a destruction, from where it comes, and after all, for whom you were working? He said, I was in the perfume industry. I said, so you were looting the molecules of the third world? And he said, uh, uh, yes. Well, he said, in the medical universe, the same is happening. Oh, it makes me so pessimistic, he said. I said, you are the collaborator of the system because the worst weapon of the system is pessimism. And if you become pessimist, you are the worst collaborator of this destruction. And he said, oh, 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 well, uh, well, we'll meet soon. And he left. So it's very interesting. I had an idea of what's happening through this short discussion. Bruce Director showed and I mentioned him here, but I could have mentioned all the others that, who contributed to the presentations of Lin's ideas. Bruce Director, in a recent class, uh, showed how creative discoveries, which are the basis for the economy, are not purchasing for cheap and selling for dear, that these creative discoveries are anti-entropic by nature and tuned to the passion for the other, the advantages of the other, the passion for creation, the agrapic commitment to increase the creative powers of the other, a power behind which, as a German friend of Einstein, Max Planck, once said, there is a conscious intelligent spirit. And it's not because Elga is here, but she always insisted on this power of the education of emotions, which is absolutely key, because if the emotions do not correspond to what you are saying, you are feeding the culture of pessimism, which is a culture of death. So this is very important to understand at this stage of history. And I see our courses as the opposite, as the opposite of a world doomed for destruction, it is an immersion in the agapic experience of beauty, this agapic experience of beauty, which is the discovery of our voice, the voice of the others, and the polyphony, which composes a thing of beauty, which is a joy forever, as Keats says, our diverse contributions generating a beautiful unity above each individual contribution. Our challenge is not to stay at the level of music, as good as it is, is to create the same unity of diversities in our political action. I'm convinced that the United States, beyond of anything you can read or see in Facebook or Twitter or whatever, is a land of opportunity for such a breakthrough. There is a good reason that Lyndon LaRouche, after all, was born in the United States. Aha. But there is a better reason that he always considered himself as a world citizen. <laughs> our challenge is therefore to create the same unity of diversities in our political action. I have read some comments from our youth in Texas and Florida. And they have made their process of change in the population 
of a fundamental depth, they say, than even what occurred in the remote La Rouge SDI moment. And I think it's very important to look at yourselves with the responsibility of this coming moment of history and what is happening in the minds of people. Now let me tell you, given that, a word about our French yellow vests. What is happening is definitely related to the disappointment with Macron, but it involves a much, much deeper issue. First, like in Great Britain or here in the United States, the conscience of the yellow vests is that they have been abandoned by the elites, that the elites have made secession against them. Second is a drop in purchasing power of people from working class backgrounds that have had to take service jobs now and more than often very far from the homes. The price increase of gasoline and diesel increased by ecologic taxes produced the shock of the straw, of the proverbial straw on the camel back. Third, they are legitimately convinced to be leftovers of the financial globalization, losing access to public services and good schools for their children, which has been the spine of the French state system since World War II. The program of the Council of the Resistance against Nazism and financial feudalities. The so-called periphery and forgotten France has suddenly come to the traffic circles to show that it exists and demands justice. It has generated, which is, I think, one of the most interesting aspects of this wave, it has generated a surge of rebellion French, which means crude and dense way of speaking, <laughs> even if imperfect, against the frozen words of the court and the administration. It is a groundswell wave in the whole country and also in Europe. It is what Rosa Luxemburg called in her times a mass strike ferment, and I stress the word ferment. Until now, with no real national leaders, but an agglomeration of local or regional organizers. They are now conscious and they are starting to engage themselves in a process of economic, social, for some of them, also cultural education. We are involving, we are involved, we are involving some of them in the basics of physical economics, of physical economics education, and a yellow vest from southern area, from the southern area of France, close to us, wrote a petition for a citizens' initiative referendum. It is in French called RIC, Referendum d'Initiative Citoyenne, calling for a national bank and the French state to recover the power of credit uterans. The interesting point is that they demand a time for thinking and deciding and reject the rotten political parties. Remember that the goal attacks the regime of the parties, not the parties in themselves, but the regime they all belong to. All kinds of operations and provocations have been launched against the Yellow Vests, but we hope that their commitment to justice and a better future will lead them to change the politics of our country. Our main task is to help to give them a better sense of who the enemy is and how to fight it. They are definitely one part of the coming world of Lyndon LaRouche, provided that we keep and uplift the ferment, the ferment of the mass strike ferment. The proverbial Chinese sign, which means danger at a point of juncture, is very proper to our times but it is also a point at which things can change in a world where people fight to build road, roads and bridges, not only houses, a world land bridge to bring change in civilization, transforming danger into opportunity. It is in Lyndon LaRouche's words that we find the best guidance above and beyond in those times of trouble. So let's be with him. This is his webcast address on August 1, 2009. Let's listen to the wise and passionate words of Lyndon LaRouche. This is a question from Argentina. She says, Mr. LaRouche, I am a 21-year-old single mother and also a student at the university halfway through my program of studies. I've been reading your work for approximately three years 
and I see no other ideas or projects that will get off the inclined plane on which we find ourselves, and which unfortunately appears to be endless. My question to you is this. What do we do to transmit to the majority of the world's youth who only live in the present and do so very badly? The idea that they have a concrete, real, and effective future based only on cultivating the creative abilities of their minds. Thank you. I think fairly simply after what I've said in this direction already today here is that let's take the space program. We need to get at the heart of these matters in an exemplary way and an exemplary way should also be a highly practical way. I think the objective uh, because it involves, see, it involves a concept of a change in the image of what man is. When you go to constant acceleration as a required modality in flight of a human being from one planet to another, you're operating in a completely new kind of domain, the domain of the relativistic relations, relativistic uh, travel, transport. And this is a great challenge because you have to think about when you're getting out of a one gravity situation on Earth into this kind of, of artificial gravity. You are in a relativistic environment. Your definition, your terms of thinking about the same old things you knew before are now presented in a new way. A human race eventually has to live in the universe. We have to live in the solar system. We have to live in the galaxy in the longer term. We have to face the challenge that that represents. We have to see, you have to think like an immortal person. That is to think in such terms that you are thinking about mankind in the distant future. And you're thinking about your place in relationship to mankind in the distant future and even distant planets. Because you're looking for something in yourself which has permanent value. We're all mortal, we're born and we die. But we're not animals. We're creatively thinking creatures. And the meaning of our life does not lie in our biological existence as such. It lies in the meaning for humanity before us and after us in what our lives have contributed to the existence of humanity as a whole. We have to see ourselves as human in that way. And therefore, the best way, practical way, is always to look ahead, to look as far ahead as you can look and into the future and see what it is that you must do for the future so that your hand is at the tiller long after you're dead in that way. And obviously, if you're going to chart a course, you have to chart a good choice, of course. So pick one. Pick a destiny. Pick a destiny two generations, three generations, four generations before your life today. Try to reach that far. Try to make something that you do something that contributes to the future of humanity. Find your identity in the future of humanity after death. Commit the kind of acts and kind of development that mean that. And act accordingly. Because that is the secret of true happiness. That is the pursuit of happiness as understood by Leibniz, as recorded in his a second reply to Locke, which became the cornerstone of our Constitution through first the Declaration of Independence, where it is, is the meaning of our existence as a nation, and was reflected again in the preamble of the Constitution in its own way. We have to be immortal. We have to assume, be immortal by assuming immortal responsibilities reach beyond our own life to what we can do now, 
which will touch in a beneficial way generations of people after we're dead. In that way, you know you're immortal. If you think like that, you know you are immortal. If you can act like that, you do even better. There is anything else to say. There isn't anything else to say. Let's take full responsibility for creation across the oceans. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. John Gong, Professor of Economics at the University of International Business and Economics, Beijing. His topic, Chinese Investment in American Infrastructure Under the New Sino-U.S. Relations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Dear Mrs. Orouge, uh, leaders of the Sheila Institute, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be invited here to the Sheila Institute's conference in Morristown, New Jersey, which is a beautiful North Jersey town that I'm so familiar with. Not far from this hotel is the Morristown Green. Take the second exit onto South Street, drive for less than two miles to arrive at 445 South Street. That is the complex where I used to go every weekday, every weekday for seven years until 2001 when I was a research scientist at the Pi Research Lab at Bell, Re Bell Communications Research. Today I'm in China teaching economics at the University of International Business and Economics. In a way, my personal experiences, both in the United States and in China, testify to the extent of how our two great countries are interconnected and our two great economies are intertwined. I want to start off by giving you an assessment of the current status of the Sino-U.S. relations. First, as we all know, that we're unfortunately engaged in a trade war. Official tariffs were first slapped on $45 billion worth of Chinese exports here on July 6, two days after America's Independence Day. Rounds of tariffs ensued on both sides until the two presidents met at the G20 summit on December 1, 2018, where truth was reached so as to leave some time for further negotiations. China committed to buy several billion dollars worth of American agricultural and energy products, uh, including some immediately, while the US side promised to postpone the uplifting of tariff rates from 10% to 25% for 90 days, which is gonna expire on March 1st this year. Three rounds of negotiations have taken place in Washington, DC, and in Beijing. Just yesterday, a round of talk was concluded with the American delegation led by U.S. Trade Representative Ambassador Lai Heiser and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, who were also received by President Xi, which is a very good sign. According to President Trump, the talk has gone extremely well. I am less concerned about the prospect of reaching a trade deal here. As the largest trading nation and the second largest economy, China cannot afford going back to an old world severed from the global system of trade and capital investment. On the American side, although there are people close to the, present, close to the president who view these destructive tariffs as indeed the ultimate means intended for a total decoupling strategy between our two countries, I believe at least President Trump doesn't think like that. And he needs this, what he described as the largest trade deal ever in history. According to the published transcript in Washington Post of a private telephone conversation with Bob Woodward before Woodward's fair book came out. So after three rounds of minister level talks, there will still be some thorny issues left to be haggled over personally by President Trump and President Xi, such that both sides can somehow declare victory. 
It may happen before March 1st, the deadline, or it may be a few weeks after. That doesn't matter. That's not a big deal here. But I'm more concerned. <clears throat> but I'm more concerned about the overall Sino-U.S. relations. Aside from the prospect of reaching a historic trade deal, this relationship is facing long-term difficulties that impose great constraints on our further economic relations. At the surface, our dispute appears to be about America's trade deficit with China, which reached $375 billion in 2017, according to US statistics. But what lies at the heart of the matter, as we all know it, is America's concern for the rise of China's comprehensive national power, including economic power, soft power in Chinese vocabulary, sharp power in American vocabulary, or whatever definition of power scholars can come up with. And I venture to take a step further in stating that the heart of the heart of the matter is Washington's concern for losing its technology edge to China, and perhaps more importantly, what America perceives as the reasons behind this trend. The American narrative, which is in wide consensus across the aisles in Congress, is that China is able to progress quickly, mostly because of the notion of a state state capitalism for things like industrial policy, state subsidies, support of state-owned enterprises, and other contentious structural issues. About technology and innovation, China advances mostly because of APR theft and coercion. Although all these issues are of concern to Washington, by far the most important issue is with respect to technology and innovation. And in that regard, keeping a technology edge is vital for maintaining good American jobs and its defense supremacy. Fair enough. I think it's indeed a legitimate demand. The respect for IPR, that's intellectual property right, should constitute an indispensable component of fair and just global competition, both among companies and among nations. Matt Pottinger, Senior Director for Asian Affairs at the National Security Council, famously said about the competition between China and the US, I quote, in the United States, competition is not a four-letter word. But I'm not sure a nation can climb up a technology ladder by just theft and coercion. I've visited dozens of companies in China who have never gone through technology transfers of any kind, but are now thriving on global markets. For example, uh, Sandy Heavy Industry CTO told me that it's indigenous from day one and innovation on its own has always been in the company's gene. But notwithstanding whether all of these IPR-related acquisitions are true or not, Let's talk about ways to address these issues so as for the two great nations to avoid the kind of thucycides trap we have tragically seen in history. Today, America labels China as a competitor, a rival, an adversary. It hasn't been elevated to the enemy status yet. Let me quote one paragraph in the latest 2019 National Intelligence Strategy report put out by Dan Coates, the current director of national intelligence, leading the intelligence community of 16 federal agencies. I quote, Chinese military modernization and continued pursuit of economic and territorial predominance in the Pacific region and beyond remain a concern, though opportunities exist to work with Beijing on issues of mutual concern, such as North Korea aggression and continued pursuit of nuclear and ballistic missile technology. That though statement puts our relations still on a hopeful footing. The paragraph about Russia doesn't have that though. The prospect of China taking over the US as the largest economy and accompanying comprehensive power scares a lot of people in Washington. But allow me to question the validity underlying the Americans' concern for China's rise as an economist. In economics, there is this convergence theory postulating the growth rates for advanced economies will eventually converge, and the size of the economy is essentially driven by population. <clears throat> Currently, China is still growing faster than the US, which is a bit over 6%, about 2% more than the US growth rate. But I don't see the days over 6% growth rate in China is going to last forever, and it's going to last very long. We're going to quickly enter the 5% growth territory. The trend in population is even more revealing. China is most likely 
to decline in population while the U.S. is absolutely rising. By 2050, the U.S. population with a high birth rate and aided by immigration is likely to increase to close to 500 million people, while China's population is likely to decline near 1 billion people. So over a long period of time, if we are patient enough and forward-looking enough, I'm not even convinced that China is going to take over the U.S. in any significant way. What I see is a picture of convergence in terms of economic power in light of the economic and demographic trends in both countries. What I see at most is a bipolar world where if we will ever reach there, if we will ever reach there, where China and the U.S. are probably comparable in most aspects of power metrics. And to be honest, believe me, even this scenario is many, many years away. The second American concern is with respect to the issue of the China's development model in competition with America's cherished free market model. That is, of course, the issue of the Beijing consensus versus the Washington consensus. China has its own constraints in interactions with the world due to its unique political and economic system. But I don't believe that Beijing intends to promote its model worldwide as, it's, as it exported revolution in the 1970s, which, was all, which, as we all know, turned out to be a total fiasco. China learned that lesson, and China won't export ideology anymore. I may further draw historic inspirations to instill some more confidence in this view. Chinese history is indisputably more of a history of a victim of aggression than aggression. Even during the time when the Chinese fleet ruled supreme on the high sea, we never had a wicked design on land our ships reached. In China's Ming Dynasty, within 30 years, starting from 1405, a royal court official by the name of Zheng He led seven maritime voyages across the southeast region through the Strait of Malacca into the Indian Ocean and went as far as the Kenyan coastal area of Africa. This is 87, 87 years earlier than Christopher Columbus' historic voyage to the Caribbean. While Columbus sailed with three ships, Zheng He's fleet consisted of 317 ships with about 28,000 crewmen altogether. We did not colonize places we reached with sugar and coffee plantations based on African slavery, even though our ships were at least four times larger than those of Christopher Columbus. <clears throat> our fleet size was 100 times larger than that of Christopher Columbus. And our voyage was taken 87 years earlier than Christopher Columbus. And yes, we had reached Africa too. So the regime in Beijing is not interested in competing with America globally on spread of ideology. And I want to take a step further by postulating audaciously that even the ideological differences embedded in Beijing consensus and Washington consensus are grossly exaggerated and definitely smaller than many scholars believe. The China development model, as first heralded by Mr. Deng Xiaoping, is flexible, adaptive, and is largely de-emphasizing ideological pashang, pashang in, the in the first place. In fact, someone even goes as far as claiming the China development model is essentially having no model. My own conclusion is that, in China, that the Chinese development model mostly encompasses the following three, five aspects. The role of the state, which entails industrial policy, and a state-owned enterprises phenomenon, foreign direct investment, and exports door, which is a very successful recipe uh, for economic development, priority on economic development at all costs, institutions for efficient but not necessarily liberal governance, and finally, the flexible incre uh, incremental and experimental approach to introducing reforms. So if one compares the above aspects of the China development model with the American ideological core values, there are actually more things in common than in differences. For example, I take sociologist Robin Williams' analysis of American ideological core values as an example. He listed the following, freedom, individualism, um, idolizing what is practical, volunteerism, mobility, patriotism, progress and American dream, the way I see it, the only thing that is 
fundamentally difficult to reconcile, is mostly with respect to the notion of freedom. Both countries have different notions of freedom, I guess. So, I'm, so if I am successful in convincing you the Sino-US relationship is devoid of ideological competition, and what is left of the economic, uh, what is left of American concern, got to be in areas of geopolitics driven by real politics. And the very foundation of that, in a sense, is an economic competition story. But a quick review of history highlights the fact that America's and China's economies are fundamentally intertwined and fundamentally complementary towards each other in nature. The North Pacific Trading Network, also involved Japan and South Korea as well, forms the world's largest global value chain. China's economic success is partially a, is a story of success of corporate China's participation in this America-led global value chain. In addition, corporate America's operations in China represents a, approximately a $400 billion commercial interest. About 40% of China's exports are associated with foreign multinationals operating in China. The majority of the top list, top 20 list, of the largest exporters in China is either OEMs of corporate America or corporate America itself. The Chinese and American economies are complementary because of natural and human resource endowments, respectively. America's agricultural and energy products are highly, comp are highly competitive in global markets, and so is its high end of the high tech sectors. China's efficient manufacturing contributes to the low prices at Walmart and at Amazon.com. Adding goods and services together, the trade flow across the Pacific represents close to two represents close to $800 billion of commercial interest. And that's a lot of money. Only 18 economies in the world have a GDP size larger than that. And this tremendous $800 billion commercial interest is the fundamental bedrock of a peaceful relationship between our two countries. Against that backdrop, today, China-US relations face a Thucydides trap that is different from historic examples due to these very intertwining and complementary economic attributes. That doesn't mean it does not have its fair share of problems and frictions, but fundamentally, this is a different type of Thucydides trap that history has ever seen. I call it the economic suicide trap, as most of the areas of true contention manifest in economic relations between the two, which could be partially addressed jointly by two sides. China and the US, situated on ocean apart, do not have um, deep national security conflicts, barring the Taiwan issue. Even Taiwan's strategic importance to the US has been waning over time as modern military technology is rendered less relevant. As I've been arguing all along, potential frictions and conflicts are more likely to be, root, to be rooted in a unique economic suicide trap. The possibility of escaping this trap exists, as does the hope of a peaceful and harmonious coexistence between corporate China and corporate America. And the answer is very simple. The planet is a large enough place to accommodate two giants at the same time, as long as each side is recognizant and considerate of the other side's needs and interests. Corporate China and corporate America can cooperate while competing. In some instances, why not merge or align them together to seek joint interests on global markets? In automobile industry, the success of the Renault Nissan Alliance testifies to the viability of a, such a broad cross-border cooperation. Why can't this model not be tried here as well in China? Some may question this model from an ideological perspective in pointing out the mass dominance of China's SOE behemoths in certain sectors. But, but one only needs to look at the cordial relationship between General Motors and the Shanghai Automobile Industry Corporation, which is a SOE in China. They have a successful joint venture based in Shanghai going back decades. Today, GM sells more cars in China than in the US. During the 2008 financial crisis, SIC extended a helping hand to help GM weather through its hard time. Today, the two, the two companies cooperate extensively on global markets, even in areas of R&D and, and innovation. Such a close relationship, in my opinion, should evolve to potential level that it jointly become one. 
So is this wonderful hypothetical company an American company, or is it a Chinese company? It doesn't matter. I would call it a global company in the age of globalization. China could also benefit from being selective in its industrial policy objectives. Industrial policy is controversial in the economic, academic community, uh, but one has to concede that America has its own fair share of industrial policy. It is only different in scale, but not in substance from China's. For example, the US has a DAPA program, its world-renowned national laboratories under the Department of Energy, uh, the massive research funding from the National Institutes of Health, and the many grants from the National Science Foundation programs. A few days ago, President Trump signed an executive order to promote artificial intelligence development. That smacks up every bit of industrial policy. Having said that, I think it doesn't hurt China's interest in, in focusing on a policy objective of, of, ex of excelling in select areas as opposed to being mediocre in all things. For example, um, the US prides in Boeing airplanes while China prides in high-speed railway. Some Washington think tank accuses China for being an innovation autarky, but if an autarchical approach is to be avoided, strategic trust needs to be established between the two sides uh, for the long run. And in this regard, recent actions from Washington, especially uh, the intelligence and defense complex wings of the executive branch regarding Huawei is very disappointing. Huawei may have made mistakes in the past in other areas, but it has never been a shred of evidence that companies engaged in intelligence and espionage work for the Chinese government. Washington's conviction by hypothesis is built on a statute in China called Intelligence Law Article 7, which says corporate uh, entities in China have the obligation to cooperate with the government. Uh, but there is a high, uh, higher constitution in China that says the government protects private companies' interests. Huawei CEO, uh, Mr. Lin Zhenfei said very clearly that he would never put his customers' interests ahead of anything else, and his statement does have a legal basis. Um, so I'm going to skip a few slides. <clears throat> and then last, I want to uh, talk about the Belt and Road Initiative and its potential implications for Chinese investment in the U.S. Foreign direct investment between the two countries strengthens our economic relations, serving as an additional layer of ballast to our overall relations. In terms of foreign direct investment, so far it is predominantly a one-way street from America to China. And this is all understandable given the development economy status vis-a-vis -vis China. But in more recent years, more and more Chinese capital is interested in the US, particularly in the South, in states like North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, where costs of land, utilities are cheaper than in China, and the labor cost is quite reasonable. This is particularly true in the context of the new economic geography theory which predicts a migration pattern of industrial ma manufacturing clustering, historically in a migrate from Europe to the North America, and then to Japan, to South Korea, and then to China. And it's been China for so long, such that we're starting to see a wave of outward foreign direct investment out of China, much like corporate America's offshoring movement in the 1990s. You would like to see some of this corporate China's offshoring capital as part of a reshoring back to the US, as many of those companies are active participants of the global value chain networks in capacity North America Pacific, uh, North America market. Chinese capital investment in this country can also in the area of infrastructure development against the context of President Trump's Make America Great Again campaign. This is President Trump's hallmark campaign slogan. But so far, we haven't seen many details and actions coming out of the administration about the infrastructure build out other than that war on the South border with Mexico. President Trump said that that will be his focus in the second half of his term, and we'll see. Infrastructure build-out is a great strength of Chinese companies. For those of you who have visited China, you can tell how much China has made great strides over the years. Now the government is doing this in the Belt and Road Initiative. Now there's much confusion, misunderstanding, misinformation, and even malicious attack on the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, this is not a, that's okay, thank you. <clears throat> this is not a geographical play, a geopolitical play to promote sphere of influence. This is not intended for power projection. The Belt and Road Initiative is truly motivated by seeking mutual commercial interests as opposed to promoting an ideology in competition with America. 
So this point has been repeatedly emphasized by the Chinese government. China has a huge foreign exchange reserves sitting idle here in the US. Bank of China and other major banks from China are now flush with dollar cash and other dollar do denominated liquid assets totally over $3 trillion, mostly in the form of holdings in US Treasury bills and bonds. This money can be readily used for Chinese investors to participate in America's infrastructure boom. By that, I mean Chinese investors can participate in those infrastructure projects as active equity holders, or maybe contractors and suppliers at the same time. Call it Belt and Road, call it America Belt and Road, doesn't matter. As long as China's current account trade surplus can be somehow transformed into a capital account stock in the form of money invested in America as permanent equity shareholders, and more importantly, permanent stakeholders of a stable and prosperous Sino-US economic relationship. This could be a win-win model for both countries. So in conclusion, I'm optimistic about the short-term trade negotiations, but worried about the poisonous political atmosphere in Washington, DC, regarding China in the long run. There are those political elements in the US, those on the right, representing the defense industrial complex and intelligence community, and those on the left for a phantom ideological crusade who are bent on making China public enemy number one in the US. This is deplorable, to say the least. Unfortunately, President Trump, fortunately, President Trump doesn't seem to be part of it. A good relationship between our two countries, albeit being competitive in nature, as long as it's peaceful competition, is indeed fundamentally in the American interest. And thank you very much for the opportunity and wish you all great success. <clears throat> Next, we have a statement from His Excellency Ambassador Vasily A. Nebenzia, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of the Russian Federation to the United Nations. It will be presented by Counselor Theodore Strezazovsky, the mission of the Federation of the Republic, to, uh, Russian Federation to the UN. Prospects for East-West Collaboration, the Russian Federation's view. Ladies and gents, it's real pleasure for me to be here, uh, giving the tribute to the role which Russian-American relations play in modern world and the contribution of Schiller's Institute to that relations. We wrote a statement, we prepared a statement which I will read now. First of all, I cordially welcome the organizers, participants and guests of this conference. The Schiller Institute is known for its valuable contribution to the understanding of international political processes and development of new approaches to the global challenges. The, the conferences held under your auspices are respectful platforms where the most urgent present, days, present day issues can be discussed without politicizing and ideological cliches. Uh, we were very saddened by the bitter news about the passing of Lyndon LaRouche, the founder and inspirer of the Schiller Institute. We would like to express our deepest condolences to Helga Zepp LaRouche, as well as to the relatives and colleagues. We are convinced that the paradigm of international political and economical interaction that he had proposed will be f further developed by uh, his or, uh, apprentices and associates. Thank you. Oh, thank you. We believe that the essence of the of a more human epoch is only possible when the world enjoys a more equitable, polycentric model of governance. However, recently we have become witnesses of the attempts to shatter the world security architecture. 
substitute agreed universal norms by some rules-based order, where rules are invented deepening on the geopolitical entrance to concrete countries. <laughs> Nonetheless, dangerous for the global stability is the striving on some countries, governments of some countries, to unilaterally impose their will on the global community or on specific sovereign states or even to interfere in their domestic affairs. In the same light, we, we should view the use of sanctions as a tool to execute pressure and punish the countries to, that implement a dependent policy. Russia is proud to be, uh, to be located between West and East. Historically, we have been implementing multitask foreign policy and developing relations with other countries in the spirit of mutual respect. Russia comprehensively helps to search for based on international law collective decisions to the global problems and all the countries face today, well, which all the countries face today. We constructively engage in the activities of the UN and Group of 20 to contribute to the relevant forms of interaction, for example, collective security treaty organization, Eurasian Economic Union, Commonwealth of Independent States, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, BRICS. One of the uh, conceptual pillars of developing this sort of cooperation was proposed by President Putin in his initiative called Greater Eurasian Partnership. It would bring together members to, uh, member states of the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Probably one day it would be also encompass the European Union. The previous year was marked by a number of significant steps to implement this project. A Eurasian Economic Commission and ASEAN uh, signed a memorandum of understanding, which was crucial for the extension of the geography and economy of the Eurasian partnership. Adoption of the Declaration on Further Development in Inter integrational process in the, Eurasian, uh, in the Eurasian Economic Union made it possible to extend the establishment of common markets and to uh, and add to it such areas of cooperation as education, research, healthcare, and trade. The Eurasian Economic Union and the Chinese initiative One Belt, One Road joined their, their integration and transportation pro pro projects on the uh, co contractual and legal basis of the agreement on trade and economic cooperation. Bilateral cooperation of Russia and China also takes on a global dimension. Our, ex uh, our effective foreign policy coordination, including the UN platform, has, be has become a significant factor of stabilization in global policy. We are also committed to foster our relations with another privileged strategic partner, strategic partner India. This commitment was uh, reiterated in the joint declaration Russia-India, reliable partnership in the changing world, adopted, as, uh, adopted at the bilateral summit in October. We cannot uh, but mention an unofficial summit Russia-India-China that took place in December in Buenos Aires after 12-year pause. Relations between Russia and the US are also crucially important for the global stability because the two st we are two states, uh, major nuclear powers, and the security UN Security Council permanent members. We face shared challenges. We face sh shared, shared challenges: international terrorism, military and humanitarian crisis, drug trafficking, <coughs> transport, uh, tra trans uh, tra transnational crime, and others. The success of our joint efforts of these and many other tracks is, uh, is that both Moscow and Washington are interested in and what is needed to the sustainable development of all countries. Russia understands uh, the increased responsibility of both states of the global peace and security. We have repeatedly expressed our readiness to normalize 
the relations between, between our countries. We hope that systemic political dialogue with our American partners based on mutual respect and consideration of each other's national interests will be resumed. We are convinced that present-day world has no alternative to cooperation and merge of potentials. Only this path may lead the ascent of a more human epoch. We wish for this conference to be creative and contribute to mutual trust and confidence of global affairs. We wish you every success and hope you will, be, you will have a meaningful discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. No. Good. Good. Thank you. Gravity is the soul of me. Yes. Our next speaker was a former technical director of the National Security Agency, has apparently elected to not give a title to his speech. <laughs> Wise. Oh, yeah, intelligence. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> we're calling the speech, therefore. There is no such thing as artificial intelligence. <laughs> and uh, I think people are aware that he has uh, distinguished himself by taking, shall we say, a very unpopular but apparently very truthful position with respect to the matter of Russiagate and many other matters. So I'd like to introduce William Binney. <laughs> On? Is this on? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you today about artificial intelligence. Uh, actually, uh, and, and I really want to address some of the latest developments we've had with um, um, Russiagate, the Democratic National Committee emails from WikiLeaks, uh, plus uh, you know some of the Guccifer II fabric fabrications and things of that nature. But first, I wanted to say that, that this idea, the concept of artificial intelligence, is really um, it's, it's, it's been around for a long time. I mean, I first ran across it in the 70s, 1970s. And I was saying, well, what is this? You know, and I kept thinking about it. And I said, this doesn't, this doesn't make any sense. There's nothing artificial here. Uh, you know, because uh, what they're doing, basically, is uh, capturing the thought process of humans and formalizing it in a set of, of, of code so they can execute that electronically and do it a lot faster than humans. Uh, but the point is there's nothing that isn't known by humans or input to the machine by humans to replicate what humans do. So it's not a question of something uh, just being artificial. It's really tangible. It's, a, it's the capture of the thought process of, of humans. And so and, uh, I'll give a case in point here. Um, um, when I was working there at one time, there was a, a small change. We won't talk about what the change was. but. Uh, uh, People said at the time, you know, well, we have all this programming going on. You know, let's just take all this data, throw it in the computer, and the computer will tell us what the answer is. <laughs> so, and they, uh, this is this is the uh, top thinking of NSA people. Okay, so you have to understand, <laughs> uh, they're much like the KGB. Okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so. I, so at any rate, that went on for a couple of weeks. You know, I kept throwing the data in and nothing came out. You know, surprise, <laughs> surprise. Well, and then, uh, you know, uh, of course, I kind of, after a while, I got kind of, uh, uh, you know, upset about this whole process. And I said, well, now I'll take my pencils and solve it. <laughs> and so that's exactly what I did. I took two other people and we sat down with pencils and paper, solved the problem, put the solution, solve solution into the computer so it would operate electronically, capturing the thinking process, and then the whole business worked and we got the answers. <laughs> it's the idea, though, that this is, uh, this is kind of what people are doing. They're distorting the thinking process here in the United States. The whole process is being distorted. 
It's becoming more, uh, some will call political. I think it's more like emotional. It's, an, it's a shift to emotion as a basis for thought as opposed to discipline and, and uh, professionalism. Um, and, you know, I, I take the case in point uh, with the um, uh, DNC emails that WikiLeaks had. There's been evidence there that it was downloaded to storage facilities or to a storage device that was present in that data all along, and nobody has looked at it until we took a look at it. Some of our people uh, who are associated with our research looked at this and they said, hey, look at all these uh, last, last modified timing all ended in even numbers. Well, see, the, the, the random probability of that happening is one in two for every time could be either even or odd, right? So, so the whole idea is the probability, and we looked at 500 of these, and the, so the probability of all 500 ending in even is like one in two to the 500th power. <laughs> so, and I, I reduced it to base 10 because people think it base 10 instead of two, so I said that's one, uh, one in uh, 10 to the 150th power. So I called it an, inf an infinitesimal of higher order, and somebody changed it. They said just infinitely small or something. You know? <laughs> but the idea is that, that the discipline of looking at data to see what the consistencies are in the data to make to, and to figure out what are the chances of that randomly happening, things like that, and using a disciplined thought process instead of emotion. Well, I hate Trump, so therefore he did it, you know. <laughs> I mean... And that's what the mainstream media does. I mean, I, I, I came out with the uh, Guccifer too. We, we could prove in a court of law that this guy was fabricating the data. And, and I mean, he was, uh, first of all, uh, the data we, he put out there, I mean, it was his big mistake. It's hard to make something look legitimate. If you're trying to, if you're really doing something nefarious and you try to put data out for people to look at to say, hey, see here, I've got the evidence, this is what I did. It, it really gets pretty hard to be, uh, 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 to, make, to make it to, to the point where people would be convinced, especially if you have people like us looking at it, because we, we will tear every bit apart, you know? So <laughs> we, we just like to know what, what is the real truth here? Not, not what is the emotion here. We know what the emotion is. Nobody likes Trump. They want to get rid of him, and it's a, it's a conspiracy to do that. We had a soft coup from the, from the Department of Justice and the of FBI. That's been clear from the, for, you know, for a long time. Uh, plus, I know some of these people, and they're, they're really uh, <clears throat> not very nice people. Okay, let's put it that way. <laughs> hey, I, I had an axiom while I was working in it. Say, I said, well, if a, if a politician opens their mouth and talks, that's 80% chance they're lying. <laughs> if a bureaucrat does it, it's 90%. <laughs> Case in point is uh, Clapper or Alexander or, uh, you know, any number of them have been up there. And by, and by the way, they've not been charged with anything, have they? And that Roger Stone gets, you know, what did he do? I mean, he was in for a five-hour interview. Now, I looked at it this way. If you're in for an interview with the FBI uh, for five hours, they're going to talk about a lot of things, and you have to have everything exactly right, otherwise they could charge you with lying. Who, in, who could actually, you know, tell everything correctly in a five-hour interview? You're going to make a mistake somewhere. Uh, but they're charging him. They're not doing it with McCabe or any of the other people in the DOJ or FBI, uh, or let alone Hillary Clinton, you know, or any of the people with her, or all that mishandling of classified material by those people. Hmm. At any rate, uh, we went, going back to our investigation, we had a, um, our, our guys in, uh, saw this uh, even numbered pattern in the last modified timing theme. And, uh, you know, that's a property. It turns out that is a property of the uh, FAT format file allocation uh, table format where you're reading uh, data to a storage facility. Now, uh, that means uh, fundamentally things like a thumb drive or uh, some kind of CD-ROM or something like that, reading it for storage. So it's kind of indexing at the same time, then it modifies the time to the nearest even second. <laughs> so. So uh, that implied that <clears throat> this uh, data, that these are the DNC emails from late May, um, and they're WikiLeaks data. It's on the Wiki WikiLeaks posted this. So we're looking at the WikiLeaks data that, that they had, and it ha has this evidence of storage uh, reading to a storage device, which further implies that it wasn't hacked. 
It was transported by uh, physical means. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that was with the DNC data. So uh, that says that uh, Mueller's indictment is kind of uh, in jeopardy because he no longer can claim the hacking or he has to now prove that the download did not occur at the DNC network. Otherwise, any smart lawyer would say, well, there's obviously evidence here of a download to a storage device. Uh, where was that and who did it and why are you, why are you claiming it's the Russians instead of somebody else? <laughs> you know? So I, you know, I, I'm just after the truth here. I think these people will lie through their teeth just to get anything they want. You know, their whole objective is to, to achieve their emotional end, and they'll do it any way they, they can. Um, and I think the evidence is pretty much showing that. I mean, look at what they're doing to Roger Stone and all the other people. They're going back in and just uh, interrogating them. And if they don't tell the truth, they get, they get charged with telling a lie to the FBI. Well, the FBI, in, in my case, in our case, the, the NSA whistleblowers, uh, the FBI lied to the court to get an indictment on us. They also lied in the indictment, um, and uh, they also lied with the, uh, in, in the case of the uh, dossier, the, the Steele dossier. They lied to the FISA court to get one. And the FISA court has known this all along. I mean, it was back in August of, 20, of 2002 that they discovered uh, that the FBI had lied to them in uh, getting uh, 75 warrants. So, I mean, uh, this is a long-standing, well-known problem that these people lie through their teeth to get anything they want. And look at the business of the national security letters. They, they, uh, they lie about that, too. I mean, they say this is a constitutional. Well, it isn't. The Second Circuit Court of Appeals took it on and said this is unconstitutional. And so the FBI dropped it right away because they didn't want to go any further. If it went to the Supreme Court, the whole nation would know it was unconstitutional. So they can still issue national security letters and people tend to abide by them and say, hey, this must be right, you know. Well, it's wrong, it's unconstitutional. It's already been uh, in the courts. So it, it's, a <clears throat> it's the same thing about uh, lying and getting the emotion. To, it's, this is how they're twisting thought. Uh, you know, getting, and the whole concept goes back to the sophist school of sophism in ancient Greece. So this is nothing new, okay? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's uh, you, you take, you take uh, many different people from different directions and you have them all say the same thing over and over again. What that means is people receiving that saying, gee, this must be true, everybody is saying it, you know? Where people who are in positions of power, like in, like uh, uh, in the House or the Senate or various other places, uh, you know, FBI even. So, I mean, they'll say anything. But anyway, the whole idea is uh, that when you say things like that over and over again, the repetition gets to people. After a while, they simply accept it. I mean, it was Adolf Hitler who said, uh, if you're going to tell a lie, tell a big one and tell it off until it's believed. And then there was Goebbels who said, uh, uh, if you've done nothing wrong, you have nothing to fear. <laughs> and then we get the, the NDAA section 1021 that says uh, the president can declare anybody a, um, a uh, terrorist threat and imprison them and give them no due process at all and do that, keep them indefinitely. Uh, that's also a special order 48 issued by the Nazis in 1933. After the Reichstag fire, that's how they got rid of all their political enemies and anybody else they didn't like. So uh, this is a trend that I saw coming right when it's, uh, Hayden started to introduce the process in NSA. It was very clear that this was a totalitarian process and he started that. And it was all done uh, under the emotional sense of uh, we, have to, we have to stop another 9-11 when we could have stopped it anyway, but didn't. So, um, and then uh, that, that's basically the thought process that happened with the, uh, uh, the DNC emails, which really, really were the issue. I mean, this is the one they've been claiming was all along, uh, you know, taken by the Russians and given to WikiLeaks. Uh, they can't even show anything going to WikiLeaks. And I would also point out that uh, Julian Assange in the embassy there is watched like a hawk in all different directions. You know, if he, if he uh, yells out the window, they know it. You know, 
So it's a, and all of the people that he knows are watched also like a hawk. I mean, everything they do on the internet or the phone network or anything electronic is watched. So anybody giving data to them would be seen. Uh, and yet there's no evidence of anybody getting it to them. So um, my, my, my point here is this uh, change of thinking and uh, destroying the discipline of thought uh, that's been going on, including labeling things artificial when they're not. You know, it's, it's just that continuing uh, process of de degenerating, uh, really, uh, the progress of civilization through, through thinking new things, new items, new ways of achieving things, new ways of doing things. Um, and that basically was uh, uh, under the Stasi uh, when they had this this uh, bulk bulk monitoring of their people. They did it on paper, though. We we have it in electronic form, digital form, so it's much more easy to get to, and it's easier to uh, manipulate, change also, and modify. Those are things that they can also do with this. Um, they they tried a little bit of that with us. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I was watching them and I caught them at it. And so they, they uh, I have the goods on them. I keep telling them, let's go to court. You know, I'll bring all this stuff up and we can address everything. And I've got filed uh, affidavits, uh, you know, in the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, also the Ninth, um, talking about the, the unconstitutional spying on U.S. citizens. And um, I used some of the Snowden material as uh, exhibits. Uh, and I said, well, I invented half this crap, so I'm ready to testify in court, you know? <laughs> And the government's trying to keep me out, so. <laughs> so it's only been going on for two years now, so for, and the, uh, f about six years with the f EFF, so. But the government's afraid of discussing this in open court because they know what they're doing is unconstitutional. I mean, uh, even, um, we're getting progress, I think, in Europe. Uh, the Austrian government has started to uh, say things like, um, all this bulk acquisition is, uh, the, the senior uh, courts in Austria have ruled it unconstitutional. They've also ruled that, uh, the, and the entire parliament has down, voted down bulk acquisition in a bill that was be being passed there or attempted to be passed there in Austria. So that was the first country in Europe that started to go the, and do the right thing. Now the Germans have come out and said, uh, now the uh, Facebook, uh, Amazon, all these other companies that are taking data on people and accumulating it to advertise to them and things like that is now illegal. That process can't be used that way. You can't sell their data. The GDPR in Europe in the, uh, also says that the data held by these third-party countries or companies um, like Facebook and, and Google, uh, that data belongs to the person who originated it. So that means the individuals in the individual European citizen owns his data wherever it is. So that if those companies want to transfer that data or share it with anybody, including the U.S. government, uh, why well, they have to get the permission of that person. So and they've been violating that all along. So my argument in Europe has always been the weak Achilles heel in this entire bulk acquisition and spying are the companies doing it. They were assisting the government. You can try to sue the government, but they'll drag it out for decades until you die. You know, that's what they're hoping with me, I think so. But, but I'm going to be there to the end. This, this is. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this is this is a, in my view, this is a war. When they raided me, that started the war, and so now it takes two people to end the war, and I'm not giving up yet. So. <laughs> Uh, okay, and so just to let you know, and, and then what we were doing with the Guccifer 2 data, uh, which uh, he came out and said it was hacked from Russia again, okay? So, you guys are the bad guys, okay? <laughs> let me, you know, <laughs> you know, I must thank the organizers to, uh, for their brilliant sense of humor to put us together <laughs> <laughs> on this podium. <laughs> but, uh, look. Let me let me underline one thing that uh, Russia, the Russian Federation uh, didn't interfere into William's speech process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're allowing me to have free speech. That's all. Okay. So, but anyway, with the with the Gusevich two data, 
You know, we were looking at that also, and uh, uh, the thing that came out, and this was, I was doing this with Duncan Campbell in the UK, and uh, it, it, it turned out that the highest transfer speed uh, for that download, we went through and calculated all of the speeds for every, every file transferred, and the highest one was uh, 49.1 megabytes, bytes, not bits, per second. Now, that's pretty fast for, you know, a general uh, uh, transfer of data across the Atlantic using the World Wide Web. So, uh, and we asserted that that couldn't go across, and then we had, even inside VIPs, we had groups of people who thought, well, it could, because, again, the emotional effect was there, so. But uh, we said, okay, uh, so we're gonna try this, okay? We're gonna go, so I got some hacker friends in Europe, and. Uh, some friends over here put a, a gigabyte of data out, so okay, here's a gigabyte, see how fast you can get it over there. And the best we, well, we did, um, I, actually I worked out the formula that companies are using to limit the use of uh, their, the internet. Uh, because you, you, can't, you can't open up to, like if I had a terabit or terabyte of data to send, and if I wanted to send it all at once, I mean I could occupy the line for a period of time and no one else could use it. So the companies, and I think I've got the right formula now, uh, companies have the right, uh, have, have a uh, limitation on the numbers of, uh, or the amount of data that you can actually pass through the internet. Um, and it worked out to be uh, 0.8 megabytes for a 100 megabit line and 1.6 megabytes for a uh, 200 megabit line, and uh, this is from our testing, and also uh, 12 megabytes, uh, mega, megabytes per second for a uh, 1.5 gigabit line. So all that works out to be, um, you know, ten, the equivalent of the of 10 64 kilobit lines, phone lines. That's the maximum you can use. So at least that's consistent with all the all the readings we got. And we tried it from, you know, Albania, Belgrade, and, and Serbia, um, Netherlands, a couple of places, and the UK. Um, and the best we got was 12 megabytes per second between two data centers, one in New Jersey and one in uh, London. So that, that, that meant that the best we did was less than one-fourth what was necessary to transmit it at 49.1 megabytes. So uh, technically, and I like to do the technical stuff because there's no emotion in it, it's just there, you know? <laughs> uh, so technically that was not a hack. Uh, but the time, but the, the 49.1 and all the other speeds we got are compatible with a download to a thumb drive. So uh, all of that, kind of fits, even with the Goose for Two, I mean, and, and then the other, the real kicker was he had the data from the 5th of July and also from the 1st of September. Uh, and we looked at that and said, uh, gee, if you look only at minutes and seconds and ignore the day and the hour, they, those two files merge just like that, without conflict. Now, what's the random probability of that happening? <laughs> you know, so there are nine groups over here, you know, and so I figured it was like, like nine to the uh, 60th power, something like that. So uh, it, it was also a uh, rather small number. So the point is, it's, a, it's the proof that Gooseford 2 was playing with the data. It's pretty clear what he did. He took a file on one download and then split it into two, then did a range change on the date and a range change on the hour in one file and let them sit there. So, but if you looked only at minutes and seconds, you could see right through that and merge the two. So it's a total fabrication, Gooseford two. And yet that's what Rosenstein based his indictment of the Russian GRU, right? Uh, he, so I, I, I said he was indicting spies for being spies, you know? And I said, now, if you take the consequence of what he's doing, um, we have spies who do more spying than any other spies. So does that mean the rest of the world is going to indict our, indict our spies for being spies? You know? I mean, this is insane. These people had, don't, they, they need to get a brain down there in, in the DOJ. You know? Yeah. I, they, it's all, their brains are artificial, you know, that's right. <laughs> Okay. Right. Well, I mean that just uh, that just shows that the fabrications involve a goose for two and the and the and the uh, the um, basically downloading with the DNC data itself says that all this has just been a manufactured uh, uh, episode from the from the beginning. But the positive side, you got to say something. About oh yeah, hey, Dennis is re re requiring me to say something positive. <laughs> <laughs> so so. 
So, uh, so I'll say something positive. You didn't have to tell them. Yeah. Yes, I did. Yeah. No. Uh, <clears throat> but the idea is that, uh, and uh, I should say this though, because we are also doing something positive. We're, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're devising routines and um, not artificial, of course but uh, doing routines that will actually work out very large-scale problems like um, uh, Medicare, Medicaid fraud, things of that nature, uh, without violating anybody's privacy. And also, uh, we have a policy now of um, building in software that nobody knows about to combat evil at the top. <laughs> we are assuming, we are assuming, since everything is basically a double-edged sword, it, it can be used for good or bad, uh, as we experienced with the spying, you know. So, so we need to build things in that we don't document and nobody knows about unless they go through every line of code. That's basically executable, so that's going to be a real trip for them to do that. So, but uh, the whole idea is that uh, if somebody in, in the top decides they want to do something evil, uh, then this software will pick it up and automatically alert everybody and they won't even know what happened. So. <laughs> That's the whole idea is that to do that in a positive way so you can actually succeed at doing things like stopping terrorists or, you know, <laughs> things like that. Things that they aren't doing now because they're looking at too much data and they don't have enough analysts to look at the data to find the threat coming. So, you know, it's, a, it's just pathetic what they're doing. Um, it's the change of the thought process making it more political, more emotional, and not being disciplined and structured. So that's... That's the positive side. I think the exchange that went on between you uh, and uh, Mr. Stresozowski was quite positive as well. <laughs> We're going to hear next from Jason. Jason Ross, Show Institute co-author of the ex report Extending the New Silk Road to West Africa, to West Asia and Africa, the urgent need for a new paradigm in Africa. Yeah, we just read up there. We just read up the business about the GNC data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the I think I wrote well, I'm, it's a great honor to be here to speak to this wonderful event. I'm glad so many people are here. We'll have to get a bigger room next time, it seems, which is really good news. What I want to discuss today is the urgent need for a new paradigm, really in the globe, using Africa as a case study. And I want to talk a little bit specifically about Lyndon LaRouche's proposal for a new Bretton Woods conference as the way to create a new paradigm and institute a new order of economic relations among nations in the globe, something that's absolutely needed at present. If we take a look at the world as a whole, just looking at it at night provides a very good way to get a sense of its state of economic development. Places that are dark at night, it's because there's no electricity. So looking at this map, it's easy to identify what some of these places are, either due to a lack of development or due to just a lack of people. So some of these areas, for example, Australia, there's just not a lot of people there. Africa, not a lot of development compared to what it should be. You can look at the United States and see the difference in land use. Canada, you know, it looks like Canada is about a 60 mile sliver north of the United States, I think. Yeah. So what's going to change this? How are we going to make this, uh, how are we going to make the world what it ought to be? The African Union has adopted what they call Agenda 2063. They adopted this in 2013, a 50 year proposal for the development of the African continent. This is their headquarters in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. One of the proposals is for a trans-African highway network. Many of these routes do currently exist. The condition isn't great everywhere. Completing this project will be a great transformative step to integrating the economies of Africa. 
Power is another absolute essential for development. You can see on the map here the Congo River passing through the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And almost where it enters the Atlantic Ocean is the perfect location for hydropower basically on the planet. Very steep drop of a very huge river. This is second only to the Amazon in terms of its flow out to the ocean. Huge river. A wonderful place to make 40,000 megawatts of hydropower. Good, clean, non-polluting hydropower. So this plant, which has not been built yet, was dropped by the World Bank as being environmentally irresponsible a few years ago. This is just one example of what we heard from in that clip from LaRouche earlier speaking in Germany on his, uh, when he was 90 about the green policy being a suicide policy. It's not only a suicide policy, it's also used as a homicide policy, as a new form of what's like colonialism. And this is a, a very, I think, grand example of that. In contrast is the really exciting development of relations between China and the African nations. Every three years, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation meets, alternating between Beijing, or between China, and the capital of an African nation. At the last meeting that was held in 2018, the meeting was in Beijing. It'll be in Senegal in 2021. What China has been doing with its cooperation with Africa has been making available large amounts of credit for the kinds of projects that just make sense rail lines, power systems, water systems, transportation, road networks, industrial parks, these kinds of significant investments. This is not charity. This is not a case of somebody saying, we're going to step up to the plate and donate to those poor Africans who can't help themselves. That's not the case. The United States is a bigger donor to Africa than is China. But I think if you speak to many African nations in terms of which nation is doing more at present to providing a long-term future, it's not aid that lasts for a year. It's taking the lid off and saying, we're going to develop a full economy here, not perpetually slightly alleviated poverty. That's not a future. And let's look at the numbers on this. These are the United States, Africa, and China as comparisons by scale, population. Africa, China, similar number of people, despite Africa being about three times larger as a continent than China, at least three times larger. There's the US. Energy use. The US and China use a similar amount of energy. China, however, has four times the people. When we look at it on a per capita basis, here you have a sense of how much energy is available per person. Very quick, very simple numbers. But you can see that there's a massive deficit to be overcome. And when this is done, the benefits will be enormous. Currently, transportation, for example, in Africa, between nations, among nations, is at such a poor level that there's very little trade between African nations. Most trade by any African nation is not with its neighbors. It's with countries outside the continent. You can see the percentages, very small. If the road networks and the rail networks are developed, you can see the estimates for, in many places, 10 times the trade flowing. The potential is all there. It's huge. And it needs to happen. This is a chart of passenger rail use by country, color-coded. Freight rail use by country, color-coded. Access to improved water. There's a lot to be done. Now, what's preventing this? Although 50 years ago, <laughs> although 50 years ago, about 50 years ago, 50-something um, years ago, the African nations, by and large, received official, achieved, excuse me, official independence. Full economic independence has not occurred because colonialism has continued, although in other forms. And that colonialism is not the Belt and Road Initiative. It's much more the British. Take, for example, this ridiculous institution. Here you see a bunch of people sitting with a throne in the background, family portrait here. This is the British Commonwealth. Among the people in the audience here, smiling behind the creepy queen, who's got her, her mace in front to bash you in the head with if you don't agree with her. 
We see leaders of powerful countries with many people. I see the president of Nigeria. I see Prime Minister Modi of India. Over a billion people. There's only about 60 million people in England. Why does this institution even exist? Why do people willingly go to grovel before the queen and say we're gonna continue essentially the old colonial system? Let's look back at another colony and how it reacted to the British system. Our United States Declaration of Independence in setting out the causes for which we declared our independence from Britain said at the end, let facts be presented to a candid world. What was the first of those facts? Don't let the license plates in DC fool you. It was not taxation without representation. <laughs> it was this one right here. He, King George, has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. The number one item on the Declaration of Independence, the common good is not being promoted. There is a refusal to allow the promotion of the common good. Compare that with National Security Study Memorandum 200, authored under Henry Kissinger in 1974, which stated for about two dozen countries in the world that the growths of their population represented a threat to U.S. strategic interests because it would be more difficult, essentially, to get materials from countries that were developing and prosperous than countries that are disarrayed and poor. When the British ran their official empire, Take, for example, India. Some people say that, well, at least Britain helped develop India, built the railroads, et cetera. No, Britain ruined India. India was the, one of the world's leading um, manufacturers of cloth, for example. Had a major shipbuilding industry, destroyed by the British. Empire destroys the economic potential of its colonies. And that is the reason that development has been deliberately held back in the world. In a sense, what China's doing now with the Belt and Road Initiative, not to minimize its importance, because it's, it's tremendously important, and keeping in mind its origins and the promotion of the new Silk Road, the World Land Bridge by the Schiller Institute, by Lyndon and Helga LaRouche for decades, it represents something that is very just sensible in a certain way. Cooperate with others. You can develop together. The whole idea of the Thucydides trap, as Professor Gong had referred to, depends on the idea that the nations which are going to compete with each other, both having the view of themselves as existing to be powers, as having their interest being essentially empire or domination. If that's not the relation among nations, another's rise is not your loss. And there is no reason to look at the world like a mischievous child who sees somebody else getting the candy and then getting mad at them. We can all grow together. I want to give one example now, very briefly, of a specific project in Africa and look at how it is moving forward and then briefly conclude with what this means for the world as a whole. Again, this is an example of the World Bank withholding its assent to financing the most wholesome and necessary for the public good, the dropping of the Grand Inga Dam. The example I want to take up is Lake Chad. We'll see a few maps, so if you're not familiar with where this is, you'll get some more. For those who know the geography, this is the catchment basin of Lake Chad. It's an interior lake in Africa. Water that comes into the lake, it doesn't leave. That's where it goes, it just evaporates or filters through the ground. It doesn't flow out to the ocean. There's not enough water to sustain this lake. You can see in these images how its size has both fluctuated significantly and overall shrunk dramatically from the mid-1970s. So over the last 40 years, the lake has lost 90% of its area, 90% of its water, while the population around it has increased several times. There are now 30, 40 million people essentially economically dependent on this lake in various ways, and the lake is disappearing. What is to be done? There is a proposal that has been made for decades and has been promoted by the LaRouche movement. It initiated from an Italian company, Bonifica, to take part of the water that goes into the Congo River 
again, second largest flow rate in the world, plenty of water, take 8% of that water and through a series of dams upstream, create a channel where the water could flow by gravity into the river that you see in the upper left of this image, which then flows into Lake Chad. This could refill the lake. You could make hydroelectricity. You could make power at each of these dams. You would have a navigable channel for barges to transport things. You could build a road along it. It's an excellent idea. Here's another image of the two catchment basins there. OK, so anyway, this can be done. There's some more pictures. As far as the updates go on this, this is something that's been floundering for decades, although just recently, in the past couple of years, tremendous steps forward, again, in part because of China. In December 2016, Power China and Bonifica both signed agreements to do more work on the feasibility. In February 2018, at the Lake Chad Basin Commission meeting in Abuja, Nigeria, the assembled countries said, this is the way we're going to go. Water transfer is the only way to save this lake. That's what people on the ground say. What, regrettably, Western donor countries, the ones giving money to slightly alleviate the poverty, they don't even want to talk about this. They'll hold a meeting and talk about more efficiently identifying people at risk of starvation, but they will not talk about refilling the lake, not on the agenda. So what's needed is the United States, Russia, China, India, to come together and to call another conference like that held in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire at the conclusion of World War II. At that conference was put in place a system that overall worked for decades, a stable financial system. Roosevelt had the goal that after World War II, all colonies would be freed, not just ending Nazi, and Japanese attempts at colonization, but the British Empire, the French Empire. If these four countries come together to institute a new system on the planet today, we can grow out of the, frankly, adolescent oligarchical viewpoint that says another's rise is my loss, and recognize that we have shared human dreams for development and that if we work together, we truly will all benefit and will also be much happier. Thank you. Dennis, are you here? I'm not speaking by myself. <laughs> Please come up. Our final speaker for this session, Dennis Small, Executive Intelligence Review, Ibero America Director, Justice for the World, Why Donald Trump Must Exonerate Lyndon LaRouche. Thank you. And as the caboose of this panel, my remarks were designed to be short, and they will be. Um, I do want to say that what, uh, in preparation for this, uh, the remarks I had crafted were done before Lyndon LaRouche passed away. And I considered whether or not modification was required, and I decided that it was not, because what I have to say applied then as now to the living Lyndon LaRouche, the one who's alive today. <laughs> 30 years and three weeks ago, on January 27th, 1989, Lyndon LaRouche was incarcerated to serve a 15-year sentence. He was released on probation after serving five years in federal prison for crimes which he never committed and which the corrupt prosecution knew perfectly well that he had not committed. 
a number of his associates were also sentenced to terms ranging up to 77 years in a series of related federal and state prosecutions. The intention of the British Empire and their American lickspittles who carried out that legal atrocity, which involved in the memorable words of LaRouche's appeal lawyer and former US Attorney General Ramsey Clark, and I quote, a broader range of deliberate and systematic misconduct and abuse of power over a longer period of time in an effort to destroy a political movement and leader than any other federal prosecution in my time or to my knowledge." Close quote. The intention of this was to kill LaRouche, to break and bankrupt his political movement, and to bury LaRouche's ideas forever. They failed on all counts. <clears throat> but, but what they did succeed in doing was to deprive America and the world of their most illustrious statesman and economist, the adoption of whose policies would have made the world an entirely different place today. The greatest travesty of justice was the one done against the peoples and the nations of the planet, and against the very concept of man, which has been the central commitment of LaRouche's life's work. It is that injustice which must now be undone if the planet is to survive. Justice for the man means justice for his ideas. As LaRouche has frequently noted, great revolutionary discoveries don't float anonymously in abstract space. They are associated with individual human beings, Cusa, Leibniz, Hamilton, LaRouche. They are the living soul of those personalities. As Cusa put it, quote, mind is the same as the soul of a human being. Mind is a living substance. Its function in this body is to give it life. And because of this, it is called soul. Mind is a substantial form or power. Close quote. In his final speech, final public speech before his December 16, 1988 conviction, which was delivered one week earlier to a Food for Peace conference in Chicago, and many of you have recently heard this or seen this, but it bears repeating. On that occasion, LaRouche, LaRouche was unswerving. He said, and I quote, we are speaking of the future of hundreds of billions of unborn souls. Think of Kuz's concept of soul without whose success our lives mean nothing. If we fight so, if we fight with love of humanity, by thinking especially of those hundreds of billions of souls waiting to be born, and thinking also of those whose martyrdom and other sacrifice gave us what was our potential and our debt to them, respecting what we pass on to the future, we then think of our lives not as things, which are lived for pleasure in and of themselves, but as an opportunity to fulfill a purpose, a purpose which is reflective in what we bequeath to those hundreds of billions of souls waiting to be born in their condition." Close quote. With that in mind, consider what the Earth's next 30 years would have been like had LaRouche's frame up been defeated back in 1988. Because LaRouche's policies for replacing the deadly looting of Wall Street and the city of London with a just new world economic order of universal high-tech development, because those policies were not implemented, hundreds of millions of people around the world remained in poverty and tens of millions perished unnecessarily. It has only been with China's recent adoption of policies very similar to those proposed 
by Lyndon and Helga LaRouche, going back 50 years ago, only now that the genocide has stopped in at least large parts of the planet. Then turn to the strategic domain. Because LaRouche's SDI policy, as adopted and proposed by President Ronald Reagan in 1983, was sabotaged and not carried out then, the world today teeters at the edge of thermonuclear confrontation. And it does. Only a return to LaRouche's original design of the SDI ballistic missile defense and today's SDE, or Strategic Defense of Earth, based on new physical principles and cooperation with Russia and China, not against them, only that can now pull us back from the brink. And for example, again, consider, because LaRouche's proposal for cooperation between East and West after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the reunification of Germany, which LaRouche famously forecast, as we heard earlier in some of the excerpts that uh, Dennis presented, because that was rejected and LaRouche was hauled off to jail three months after Russia was, wa was ravaged and the West looted under Thatcher, Bush, and Mitterrand, and a wave of permanent wars was unleashed, which is with us still today. Because LaRouche's proposed war on drugs against London's doping banking apparatus, which is what runs the drug trade, because that was never implemented, a drug epidemic today is poisoning our nation and the world. Because a corrupt FBI, Department of Justice apparatus, which we've heard some more about today, under British intelligence direction, got away with their legal atrocity against LaRouche, that same apparatus, in fact, many of the same individual players, are now deployed to carry out a de facto coup d'etat against the President of the United States, who has himself vowed to put an end to the endless wars. Had LaRouche not been railroaded and those criminals ended up in jail, we would not have that problem today. That's a fact. And because LaRouche's policies for generating a new renaissance of classical culture and science were swept aside, we now stare into the pit of hell, of a new dark age that is engulfing our youth in particular. All of these policies flow from LaRouche's abiding love of truth, love of humanity, and love of a good fight. In a press conference held right after his conviction, and I remember it well, <laughs> LaRouche best summarized was what was at stake. And this is a quote, the date of the conviction, December 16th, 1988. Quote, my function, said LaRouche, is not to gain personal prestige for myself. I never cared for it. I never sought money. I never sought personal prestige. I have other things that are important to me and that keep me happy. For example, tomorrow I'm having a scientific seminar, and I'm going to be very happy with that. My function is the service I have performed for the United States and civilization." Close quote. And in his allocution before Judge Albert Bryan, in the rocket docket prior to sentencing on January 27th, 1989, LaRouche began by stating, quote, the court, I am sure, is not surprised that I know myself to be innocent of any wrongdoing in this matter. And the court, I think, would also not be surprised to know that I view the jury's verdict as equivalent to a presentment repealing or proposing to repeal the laws of gravity <laughs> in respect to the facts, close quote. And after then pointing the finger directly at the British establishment that had ordered the railroad against him, Your Honor, LaRouche concluded with remarks that remain our clarion call today as we urge President Trump to at last exonerate Lyndon LaRouche. Quote from Lynn. This group of trials 
by shotgun methods is an attempt to eliminate me from the political scene. This has already done great damage to the United States. The time has come that this evil and reckless prosecution be brought to a halt before much greater damage is done to our United States." Close quote. The time indeed has come. And I would like to conclude with a proposal, which I have discussed with Helga over the last day or two. Trying to think about what the British Empire would most fear I think what we have to do is publish the collected works of Lyndon LaRouche now. <laughs> clear, after the conference, go home, clear off an entire bookshelf, not just one shelf, but probably the entire bookshelf. I don't know how long and how big this is going to be, but whatever it is, it has to be done. And I suggest that among the many resolutions that come from within ourselves at this conference, that be one of them, because the way to do justice to LaRouche is to make sure that the ideas and the passion around which he built his life and which he educated us to be able to carry out in his physical absence, but in the presence of his soul, of his mind, that we now carry that forward with the kind of commitment and passion which they require to achieve success. Thanks. Okay, we're now in our question and answer session, and uh, uh, as people move to, we have one or two mics? One? Mic right over here. I'm gonna make a few announcements. Uh, let's see. Let's, we make announcement. Things people forgot to pick up after going through the magnetometer. <laughs> Unless they really want to give us their car keys, et cetera. Okay, so you should pick those things up if you are one of those persons. Uh, uh, this is for this next session. People should know that this is a musical uh, panel that will be, or a panel about music that will happen in the next session. And the first six rows of chairs will be moved during the break. So people in those rows need to take all of their belongings with them as they exit. That's obviously a useful one. <laughs> oh yes, I'm also being prompted from the uh, front that you should exit efficiently. I think what that means basically is that we have to do a sort of reconfiguration of the room. So we want people to try to um, uh, not come up necessarily to talk to the speakers up here. Everybody will be moving out of the session uh, right at 1 o'clock or just before. Uh, uh, let's see. Now, I'm certain that my wife has at least one. Ah, yes. Schiller Institute membership drive. If you are not a member of the Schiller Institute, join. I don't think there's much more that has to be said, especially if you've been awake for the last several hours. Uh, I think you got that idea, so I guess that's that one. And if there are other announcements, I think we'll wait until we go to those because I see so many people here with, uh, with questions. Um, so let's just open it up. Yes, and please just announce your, who you are so we then know. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and thank you, people of uh, Goodwill. My name is Alex Mbianda. And I am from the great state of Massachusetts, but originally from the southern Cameroons in West Africa. Uh, 
I, I would like to uh, beg uh, your pardon, Mr. Chairman, that my question is going to be converted to uh, organic intelligence, not artificial intelligence. So I'm going to be making a statement, not asking a question. So I will start off by greeting you all in a special way. And if I say, Grr J, you answer, hey. Yeah. Grr J. Hey. Uh, that was artificial intelligence. I want organic intelligence. Grr J. Hey. Thank you so much. <laughs> I want to call the attention of this great world order in this room right now, that there is an ongoing genocide happening in southern Cameroon as we speak. There are thousands of people, over 300,000 people internally displaced and in bushes, some in foreign countries, some inside trench holes, and nobody is talking about it. So please, at the end of this little presentation, join me so that we can, as one, as we talked about humanity, stand up and request that that genocide should stop as of today afternoon. The British Southern Cameroons have gone through a lot of trauma. Southern Cameroons was colonized first by the Germans. They taught them how to drink. <laughs> Second, by the British, they gave them to the uh, French as a petit cadeau from the Queen. Can you imagine a group of people, over 8 million of them, handed to somebody in Europe as cadeau for the language? Uh, my French brother, cadeau means gift. So the people of Southern Cameroon were given to the French as gift. And today, La Republique du Cameroon, that came into a side-by-side -side living negotiation with the Republic of Southern Cameroon is annexing it and killing all its people because the people stood up and said, you cannot annex us again. So I want us, as we go home, to know that this genocide is going to wipe and, in fact, eight million people if we do not act now. We did not act in Rwanda because it was in Africa. Let's act now because we have a change of mind, humanity. <clears throat> I would like to speak to Queen Elizabeth <laughs> through your voice that you all join to say yay, meaning that we all agree that humanity or that the suffering of human anywhere in the world is the same in the spot where we are standing. So if somebody is dying in southern Cameroon, we all have a collective responsibility to act. And so that action to, should be today. So I want to talk to the queen. Excuse queen me. Queen Elizabeth. Excuse me, excuse me, sir. Just want to have to say this to yeah. you. Uh, we have, I think, about a nine other people on the line. And we have 50 minutes. Okay. And I am now doing stopwatch with people. Okay. Thank uh, you. You have, you have, I'm going to give you another 60 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I will use artificial intelligence to present this. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth, this is time for you to do the right thing. <laughs> Admit that you screw up and correct your mistakes. Don't take them with you to hell because the older British monarchs have occupied all the space. So we, the young generation, will forgive you if you do the right thing and take away some of your blames. There is no enough blame to go around, so don't take them with you as excess luggage to hell. <laughs> My dear people, let's act now before a group of humans in West Africa are extinct. Let's not talk about Rwanda again in this century. Thank you so much. I will yield the rest of my, I will yield the rest of my one hour to my colleague here from Southern Cameroon. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, I'll just I note, excuse me, I'll just note that uh, Jacques will say something later concerning this entire matter. 
just wanted to say that. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, greet everybody, and I really feel so happy to be in a room filled with people who care about the humanity. My name is Harriet Fomuki. I'm a registered nurse in the state of Massachusetts. The past three years have been hell. I feel like I've been living like a double life, like I'm here, but my spirit is dead somewhere in southern Cameroons. Given what is going on on the streets that I grew up in, please, I would like to take this opportunity to plead with you that please, there are some innocent, vulnerable, southern Cameroonians, women, children, unborn children that are being slaughtered daily. As we speak right here, there are many who are being slaughtered right now. For some reason, it seems as if the world has closed its eyes on us. But I know as from today that I have met this big group of loving people, I know it is going to change. Please, I do, we have some flyers. I cannot say this without thanking our Boston Sheila Farm Institute family that we've been meeting, especially Mrs. Uh, Clorette and Mr. Bill Carl. They have been a wonderful support. Thank you and thank to the rest of the Boston family that we meet, all the support they've been given. But I feel like today, it is definitely going to take a different change and the people of British Southern Cameroons will know that there are people in this world who still care about humanity and here they will have that information and do what it takes to save lives. Thank you so much. Very good. My name's uh, Bob, I'm from New Jersey. I'm a fan of Mr. Benny's and uh, I have a, a question that he may or may not want to answer. Um, you know, I've heard you talk in the past about uh, Mr. Snowden and you never talked about him in a derogatory way. So with that as kind of, uh, you know, a framework, I'm wondering about like, uh, my perception of like the NSA is that they're kind of like the good guys and my perception of the, uh, the CIA is that they're like totally uh, disjointed from the country and it's like they're their own, uh, um, their own entity, not out for our interests, but for their own interests, whatever they may be. So, um, you know, I've been looking into Snowden. I know he was a, a contractor, um, outside contractor, and I guess he started initially with the CIA and then uh, he, he uh, leaked through the NSA. Do you have um, a comment on if you think that was uh, provoked to make the NSA look bad uh, for the benefit of the CIA or uh, what your thoughts are? No, no I, don't, I don't think he uh, particularly cared for the CIA either, so. But uh, I, 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 most of the people at NSA, they're, they're good patriotic people um, doing, doing uh, dedicated work to try to try to solve problems that would uh, you know eliminate people getting hurt and and illegal things happening so and also threats uh, but uh, there's a certain group at NSA who've gone down they they've taken to to the uh, they've adopted the dark side just like Cheney did you know this I call him Darth Cheney because he he said he went was going to the dark side and he took a lot of people with him okay and some of those people are still in positions of power just uh, the back end of that question is I'm, I'm also a Q follower, and um, I uh, see that, uh, you know, I'm wondering how the network of support was there for the pre president who was bold enough to uh, fight the deep state, the one world order, whatever you want to refer to it as. And um, do you think that the outline for this attack against what I call evil is, um, was kind of put into the works by uh, the NSA? Um, no. Uh, there were some of us who were doing this separately uh, without, you know, through 
um, other channels and avoiding staffs because they filter stuff. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> right. I don't want to say anymore. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Hi. My name is uh, Mary Fagan. First, I'd like to thank the speakers for your powerful speeches. And then I'd like to state that I think it's a really beautiful thing to look around us and see the diversity of humanity, right? In this room alone, we have like every culture, race, economic background coming together to fight for something. My, my um, question has to do with this. So part of your speeches were about, you know, man's mind being a machine, quote unquote, so to speak, right? And in our mind, the machine is, we have the input of our society around us that places those thoughts there, and the output of our own discernment of how it comes out based mostly maybe on our emotions. But there's another reality, and I don't know, because this is my first meeting, if you address these things, but it's the spiritual reality. The spiritual reality enlightens the mind through the soul. And when we encourage that spiritual reality, we can do a lot of good, I think, in our country. I think we lack, the, they're trying to remove God from everything and every place. And yet when we had 9-11, you know, the sayings, God loves America, God loves America. Yes, he does, but does America love God? But does America love God, you know? Does humanity love God? So I think it's very important to address this as well when we address life and life situations. Because the mind, again, is a computer or a machine that takes in the input of its surroundings where the soul is inspired through the grace of God. So that's what I'd like to say. Thank you. Okay. Nice. Okay, fine. Yeah, Dennis is going to say something. Yeah, let, let me just say one thing on this. I recommend to you uh, uh, an article written by LaRouche on this subject called uh, What is God that man is in his, in his image? Uh, and I think it poses the issues that you're raising, which are extremely important, but poses it from the standpoint, going back to the very first thing you said, here we have people from different cultures, different religions, different backgrounds, different races, different countries, different theological standpoints. What is it that is discernible, knowable to man about the nature of the creator, which it is universal and discernible to all cultures, all human beings? That's, I think, the proper way to actually pose the question. Because our task is to make sure that the entirety of humanity, not one country, not 10 countries, the entirety of the human species has access to that power of creative thinking far beyond anything that a machine could ever do, completely different, incommensurable with any machine. Think of what LaRouche was saying about this. But to make that power, which is what makes man in God's image, identifiable and knowable and reproducible. So there's a huge amount more to be said on this. I would just recommend to you and to others here as well to take a close look at this, uh, uh, this document of Mr. LaRouche's, What is Man? What is God that man is in his image? And let me also reference that there are several things that the literature table that people may wish to get, including some literature that's no longer available in printed form. So that's something else that should, should be done. Uh, there are a couple of other. Also, uh, Jason wanted to make sure that I did announce that there is a room that uh, has been set up uh, we're referring to it as the pedagogy room. It has various physical and geometric uh, examples, and uh, he and others are populating that room and are happy to talk about the concept of physical principles and where they come from and the idea of creativity and its expression in the physical world. So in the course of the after this panel uh, and also in between the subsequent panel, you can go and uh, see people there. Hi, my name is Frank, I'm from New Jersey. Um, one of the speakers this morning spoke about um, our de escalating debt and how the course that we are on long term is non-sustainable. I think that the national debt back when the financial crisis happened in 2008 was around $8 trillion. Uh, now we're at 21 or so trillion dollars. 
And um, you know, tied in with that is, is how is, is a lot of this debt created? Um, uh, the U.S. Constitution provides that only the United States government can create currency, can make currency, and yet we have what I believe to be a private bank uh, in the Federal Reserve Bank, which is affiliated with other uh, world banks like the IMF and uh, the World Bank, et cetera, that seems to be creating money out of thin air for their own benefit. In the meantime, the taxpayers of the United States and the world are becoming debt slaves to this debt. A larger and larger percentage of our uh, taxes goes to service the debt instead of paying for food and housing and medicine, et cetera. So, you know, there was bumper stickers 10 or 15 years ago that said, end the Fed. Um, I don't know, you know where that, how that ended. Um, and I was curious to know, I was curious to know what um, Lyndon LaRouche's view was from any of the panelists on the creation of money and debt, which is a necessary financial instrument, and, and what his views would have been with this escalating debt, which now actually seems to be accelerating. And what are we going to do about it in terms of the Fed and the, and the, and the growing debt problem, and where does this all end? Okay. Thank you. Jacques, you want it, or are you? Okay. Okay, Jacques will take it. Well, let me try to wrap up, uh, wrap up a, an answer to what has been raised. I think in all my life, my concern has been why, faced with injustice, people don't raise, don't react, don't do better. How is it that they are fooled? And I think to understand it, there is something that I can tell you because I come from a country where there is this big fight among the colonial side and the Republican side. If you look at World War I, why it happened? Because you had only empires fighting each other. It's not nations, they were all empires, French Empire, German Empire, British Empire, of course, the main culprit, and other empires. The only country that was not an empire was United States, but they had Woodrow Wilson. So, this I want to bring forth because the secret, I think, is not so secret, of the colonial oppression is the destruction of the self-esteem of a persons. It means that your power to be connected to the power of creation, the power is, as Nicolas von Kuss would say, you do everything to destroy it in the minds of the people. And you are telling them you cannot succeed, we know better, because we control the rules of the game and you are an infant that can't do it, the way the French treated their colonial subjects. The British, but the French were more, they were so-called, uh, preoccupied by the infants, but trained it as infants, which is probably worse in a certain sense. So uh, what I mean is that this thing is the same in our civilized country. It means what David Riesmont once said, the other directed individual. You don't believe anymore that you can be directed by your sense of justice. You have to be subjected to the oppression. This is called what I called mutually assured cowardice. You become a coward. Then, to be promoted, you have to lose your identity. You have to lose your esteem. You have to lose your moral identity because you accept the rules of the game. Then, what comes later is that you lose confidence in yourself in your moral identity, but you lose confidence in thy neighbor. You lose confidence in other people. And the same for nation. If they lose the confidence in the utterance of currency of their own money, they lose confidence in themselves and they are debased. This is what's happening in Europe right now and it's happening in the whole world. The dollar is no more an American currency. 
is a currency of the world markets and the British Empire. There's a writing by some guy, British guy called Nicola Jackson, which explains that very well, very cynically. So you have this situation where you paralyze people in diverse identities, you divide to rule, and there is no more esteem for what to do for what connects people with the laws of the universe with natural law. It's destroyed in a set of particular identities. And this process is being accelerated now in the whole world. So I think to raise an issue, it's, as our friends from Cameroon did, is extremely important. But it should be raised to the issues of all issues and to move. I was very moved myself by the obituary sent, which was one of the ones that moved the best, by our friends in Yemen, who said that Lyndon LaRouche gave us the best of our armies, the army of ideas. And they are involved, believe me, in Yemen of a, in a terrible fight. What's happening in Yemen is one of the worst things. The French and others, and the Americans and the British are giving everything to Saudis to destroy Yemen, not because of Yemen in itself, not because it is under Iranian influence, because there is in this part of the world a genuine insurrection for something good for humanity. So I think this goodness of humanity, and you can, that you as an individual are not only enabled, but you can fight for it. This is, I think, what Lin has left us as a mission, and this is, I think, how we should react to all other in, all injustice that we see, and our work in art, our work in, in music, our work in all areas of human creativity nourishes that, and people in Yemen have understood it, and you believe me, Yemen is probably one of the worst places in the world to understand it, and they do it. So let's follow this lesson and fight. There you go. <clears throat> yes, hi. Uh, this is Jose. I'm from the Bronx, so New Jersey's pretty foreign to me. Um, <laughs> my question is, in American media and politics, you often hear this idea that there's not enough money for this project. We don't have enough money to do this. We don't have enough money to do that, right? You can, well, I would ask myself, well, then, how much money does it take to fix the education in the country? How much money does it take to fix the corruption in the country, right? And the panelists here that uh, were relevant to infrastructure developments and building up countries and fixing up countries, the issue of how much does it cost did not come up. What did come up was you have to do it. So it, it has me rethinking, what is money? What is the point of money? You know, what, what does it, what, because the, the idea of not having enough money to pay rent versus not having enough money to build a high-speed rail, those are two different things, and yet you don't bring that up. So what is the Chinese perspective on money? And what should it be? That's my question. You want to say this? All right, it's a great question. Let me try to uh, address this uh, question. I think uh, in the U.S. it's kind of a regrettable that uh, we spend a lot of money on studying, um, uh, looking to the environmental impact, into uh, investigating the feasibilities. You know, a lot of money spent on this instead of money really spent on concrete and steel. Uh, there's a great article uh, published in Wall Street Journal some time ago. I'm sorry, in Washington Post some time ago by George Will talking about how the litigious society of this country has been destroying infrastructure investment. Just look at the, how much money is spent on that uh, uh, high-speed railroad between San Francisco and, kind of, uh, and, and Los Angeles. Uh, billions and billions of dollars have been spending on this for, uh, I think, over a decade now. And not an inch of railroad has been built so far. <coughs> Uh, and and uh, you know this testifies to the the problem I think in this country, uh, and in China you know I think it's very different. And just I just give you one example. Uh, think about uh, how much does it take to build the railroad physically from the time breaking ground to actually trains are running and, and carrying passengers. 
between Shanghai and Beijing, which is probably the most, uh, the, the busiest uh, railroad in the world uh, in terms of the traffic uh, carrying. Um, it, you know, it, it, it takes two years. It just takes two years to build these roads. And imagine how to do this in the US. Um, you know, you, you have to claim how many land, how many, uh, I mean, these lawsuits go all the way through the Supreme Court, I'm pretty sure, and take decades to resolve these things. In China, you know, you, 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 you argue with the bulldozers tomorrow, man. I mean, you, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the government will provide a, a package that is based on the average pricing of the you know, nearby uh, real estate prices, and that's it. Um, you know, is it fair? Is it just? Well, you know, to some people, they might be fair and they might not be just. But a country cannot be held back by some people, a small group of people who may be arguing about its property values. So, the, you know, the Chinese way of doing things is that, yeah, you, you, you argue with both, both of us tomorrow, you know? Um, so, this is a trade off between efficiency and, uh, and, and, and liberalism or, or a justice system. But you know who 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 is who is prevailing here, right? This is a very good question. So I think uh, you know this, I think there's a fundamental difference when the American side criticizes uh, the, the, the the Chinese government for being not liberal, for not being going through the due process, for for not uh, having a, a comprehensive studies about you know real impact of all these infrastructure products. Here back in China, we don't have the time to argue about these things. We you know we <coughs> we. <coughs> I think that pretty much summarized my answer. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're going to go, and then Dennis wants to talk. De De Dennis, you go okay, first. Sir. Everybody has something to say yeah. about it. So. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. I mean, how much money does it take to do that? Nothing. It doesn't take money. Money is like artificial intelligence. <laughs> its purpose is to insist on the lie that science and morality are separate. That's the purpose. That you can quantify from the standpoint of a hedonistic calculus, put a monetary value on things, and you know, as LaRouche was fond of saying, you know, a million dollars for a whorehouse and a million dollars for a steel mill. Well, if it's all dollars, what's the difference? Well, there is a difference. <laughs> and the whole idea of quantifying and measuring things in terms of money as if that were actually a metric of the economy, it's not just inaccurate and wrong, it is fundamentally immoral. I mean, you can, how can you look around the world and not do something? How, it's what Jacques was just saying. How can you tolerate the kinds of things that are going on and say, well, that's what the market is saying? I mean, it's not only that, that, uh, that uh, slave traffic and uh, illegal trade and so on is quantified. Drugs are counted in GDP on the insistence of the International Monetary Fund. There are public memos from the IMF to the government of Colombia going back to 1988, which right before Richard Grasso, the head of the New York Stock Exchange, met with the financial head of the FARC cartel in Colombia, in Colombia, in the famous Grasso Abrasso, the IMF told Columbia, well, you've got to count illicit drugs in GDP. <laughs> and, and the real nefarious part of this is not that you're counting drugs in GFP, GDP. The real nefarious part of this is that it pretends and it acts like economics is something separate from morality. That there's a difference between the science of the physical objective universe and the morality involved in human culture and civilization. They are not separate. They are one and the same thing. And I would like to say, and maybe I state a disagreement with some of the views of some other people on this panel, maybe not. I'm sure a disagreement with many of the people in this audience that it is not the case that China is the second economy in the world. China is the first economy. Because you cannot measure an economy competently with GDP. The United States is not the most powerful economy in the world. Measure it in terms of Lin's science of physical economy. <coughs> look at directionality. Look at intention. Look at morality. Look at what's happened with the poverty question. So I think that really to resolve this issue, 
and to actually answer all the questions about the Fed and so on and so forth. This fundamental underlying issue of the unity of science and morality is what's actually posed. You don't need money. You need intention. You need science. You need physical productivity. And that springs from the same source of morality, which is human creativity. The reason we are moral or have the potential to be moral is because we are creative or have the potential to be creative. If you can't change things, if you can't modify the world around you, you can always say, hey, I had no choice. Of course I killed my mother. I had no choice. I was biologically predetermined. <laughs> Your Honor. <laughs> so I think that's really the issue here. Oh. Just, yeah, I wanted just to bring a quote from Lyndon LaRouche. Monet is an idiot. <laughs> People who believed it are at best idiots, at worst traitors. And that's the truth with Monet. Money is something you can create. It's a potential. And you create the basis if you create money credit for the reimbursement. You create the basis to, for a platform in the future which permits to reimburse the credits that you have generated. This is Hamiltonian economics, and we wrote a lot of papers on that that should be read and thought about. Uh, the key, as Dennis said, is intention, direction, and who controls the utterance of credit with what intention and for what direction. And then, absolutely, money should be superseded by the moral intent and the physical economy of the future corresponding to this moral intent. solution for that arguing bureaucrats. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Oh, there we are. I, I had a simple solution for the arguing bureaucrats. I never told them what I was doing. <laughs> and so they never knew until it was done. And then if they got mad at me, I'd just say, oops. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> no, it, was, it was really cheap, too. <laughs> I just want to propose the following, that there's a lot of people on the line and there are 18 minutes exactly left. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to continue to take questions. Please be brief, but uh, at the end of the second session, the people who are in the line should reassemble. If your questions have not been answered, if they have been, fine, but if not, reassemble and people have to add on to that. That way uh, we don't have to disrespect the fact that some people have been standing here for a long time. So go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you very much, panel. Uh, I just want to say thank you all for being here. Uh, every one of you, or every single one of you, from little children to uh, those that can't walk and move, you know, you're all important. Every, everybody. Um, so on top of that, I'm going to, um, you know, not follow through my question for uh, if I should start a, um, you know, any sort of stock exchange or anything because that just sounds outrageous. Um, the, real, the real question is, uh, in, in regards of intelligence, um, we have quite a bit of information out there on YouTube right now. Um, you know, throughout the schools, uh, children not being discussed, educated on their health, on certain te specific technologies like Nikola Tesla, or anybody um, who came out of proper enlightenment. Um, nobody's being taught or educated on really empowering technologies that have existed. Um, you know, not the Nikola Tesla that is being uh, taken over by Elon Musk and his outrageous um, business models. Uh, Nikola Tesla wanted to provide free energy to the world where Elon Musk still requires a charge. That still requires effort to go into that from charging where unlimited energy potential is right in front of you and I every time. Um, this, is, this is really important because this is how you uh, can create free technology, um, especially through information like YouTube where most people can watch it, not only on their phone, but with other people too, so it's not just yourself. Uh, 
scratching your head at trying to figure out the information. You can show it to people, you can share it to people. Um, and just more importantly on the topic of intelligence is the patent rights. So a lot of these things are kept underway um, just because of how patent rights have dominated the structure of the scene um, with hydrogen uh, engines, basically, that was squashed out in the 70s. It's can be seen on YouTube of people making HHO generators in the bush in New Zealand, Australia. Um, really, it's just taking the time and energy and the dedication to change the technology that you have today. There are children in Africa that are making um, uh, solar technology out of $14 worth of trash equipment. There's, uh, I'm we sorry. have somebody that will Thank respond. If Thank you. you. I'm, I'm sorry this is not so much a, uh, a question. Uh, my question, I guess, exactly is, um, what is the best scenario that we can provide um, open source, open source um, the information so it doesn't get shut down okay, like it has once been? Okay. Thank you. Mr. Jason. It's not an issue of information. There's a lot of information around. There's a lot of information that is not hidden in the least that people aren't aware of. Many people would have difficulty reading the Declaration of Independence or the Federalist Papers. Those aren't hidden. Those are in every library. They're not suppressed. They're not hard to get. The works of Kepler, those aren't hard to get. Plato, that's around. So. It's not that there is great things that are being hidden. It's that we have a culture that doesn't recognize the richness and the intellectual patrimony that belongs to every one of us. Ideas come from a certain place. Discoveries are made. And our educational system, rather than going through where discoveries came from, teaches, at best, correct formulas that work. And at worst, you know, you just come out not knowing anything and just being confused and thinking you, you know, you hate math and you'll never get it and you hate your teacher and it's just like torture for years, which is also an experience, uh, that's what a lot of people get is their, their, you know, is their school experience with that kind of thing. So, you know, LaRouche has, uh, he put this thing in an interesting way. He said that to you, does the phrase take, for example, Pythagorean theorem represent only a relationship between sides of a triangle? Um, one that probably you've never actually found out whether it's true or not, but let's say you've probably used it in class. Does Pythagorean theorem mean that formula, or does it mean, in your mind, recollecting when you first discovered that it was true, or when you last taught it to somebody? All knowledge is a discovery. And by building up a real rigorous foundation in past knowable discoveries, you get your mind in shape to sort out the wheat from the chaff. There's a lot of chaff out there. We've heard about the Integrity Initiative, putting out a lot of chaff about Russiagate, Russian bots, and all this kind of thing. Well, I don't know the origin of some of the other chaff that gets put out there, and I'm going to say this, and people might hate me, but I'm just going to say it. The Q business, chemtrails, the Earth being flat. I'm just saying it. I'm just going to say those things. Nikola Tesla and free energy, I'm sorry, it's just not the case, okay? There's no such thing as free energy. Tesla wanted to transmit energy, and we use it. That's what your wireless phone charger is for. It's great at a short distance. You're not going to power the world or transmit energy with it. You're just not. Now, where does this come from is that, regrettably, we don't have a very strong basis of knowledge in general. I do encourage people to take advantage of the fact that we have got some geometrical and other displays where you can make your very own discoveries in executive room three during the break and uh, be able to sort out the wheat from the chaff better. There's plenty of wheat out there already. Can you recognize it? Excellent. Jason will be chairing the panel this evening and uh, I invite you all to come there to uh, discover many things that you actually already know. Um, and let me just announce one thing, that the rehearsal for the Fantasia soloists is in Executive Room 3, where the pedagogical displays are, and that will be right at 1 p.m. They say, please be prompt, because the rehearsal will be short. Okay, go ahead. Hi, this is for uh, William Benny. I'm a, I'm a pro retired programmer, and I 
followed the Russia Gate business fairly closely. And um, I, um, well, let me tell me if I got this right, okay? If, and I don't say I do. I just tell me this is the best I was able to make out what was going on. Is that the first I heard about Trump getting, being involved with the Russians, okay, was when that file was uh, stolen from WikiLeaks. Uh, not from Wik, but it was given to WikiLeaks. It was taken by, I believe, Seth Rich, uh, a DNC insider. And uh, and you know transferred I believe via Cra uh, Craig Murray uh, to uh, to um, WikiLeaks. There was that file which which had the real embarrassing data on it that uh, that you know the Clintons and the DNCs did, you know was was very embarrassing to them. So as soon as they found out about this, this is what I understand what happened. As soon as they found out that the file had been um, taken, they decided to blame it on the Russians. And um, so, and so they, what, and what they did uh, was they, 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 there was some guy. I think he was a DNC techie who was, yep. um, who was um, Guccifer 2.0, and he made up what I understand was a totally bogus file that, that had nothing to do. I mean, it was there was no information in it that was even embarrassing or anything like that. And, uh, and they, they, they tried to, you know, make it all about the Russians doing this instead of uh, the, just the data being stolen. Yes. Please. You've got 15 seconds. Oh, that's my seconds. question. Tell me, if I, tell, me, tell me if I'm right about that part of it, that this other file, this Guccifer 2.0 file, didn't really matter, and the analysis done by the VIPs didn't really... Did, did you actually analyze the real file, the one that went to... Um, to, um, to Wiki. Okay, that's your yes. question. Wiki, yes. yes, yeah, we did. And that's why we, got, that's why we found the FAT formatting, saying that it was read to a, a storage device before WikiLeaks posted it. So somewhere before there, that would fit, uh, you know, with somebody inside the DNC doing it to a download to a, a, a thumb drive. Um, and the rest of it, the Gooster 2 is pretty much, it was crap, you know, it was a manufactured thing. So it's basically, that's basically right, yeah. Yeah, and you have an article that just got... Appeared. Yeah, we just published another article. Yeah, I forget where it is, but huh. if you Google it, you, can, you Google my name or something, you'll find it. Um, uh, Larry Johnson and I wrote it, and uh, it, it had to do with the, um, the file formatting that proved that it was downloaded to a disk, uh, to a some thumb drive or some kind of disk storage device. Okay, time to hand off the mic. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Ernest Washington from the uh, city of Chicago, the second city. Hey, man. Yeah. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, for the Manhattan Project to uh, gravitate toward Chicago. But uh, uh, I would just like to say that uh, thank God for Lyndon LaRouche uh, because the wisdom, uh, his wisdom was reflected in the fact that he established uh, an international organization that will continue his work, dedicated, committed people uh, of all ages, all nationalities, and you know, sorts like that. But uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's ironic, but I think it's kind of just that we are holding this conference uh, in uh, what they call African Mary Hi American History Month. And uh, the fact that uh, uh, the leader of that movement, Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, you know, uh, the movement wasn't just for that time in that period, but it was uh, a universal. It was like a, uh, it, 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 it affected what had happened before and what came after the movement. And I think, uh, Lynn used to say, uh, what happened to the movement is to stop moving. <laughs> so so uh, I just, you know, I, if I seem to be kind of rambling, but uh, just, I, uh, again, like I say, uh, I was blessed to have met Lynn uh, before all of this artificial intelligence and, and uh, you know, they were started to get, you know, started to uh, try to kill him and put him in jail and everything. Uh, and uh, again, on the point of uh, this not Black History Month, when I first came around the organization, used to have uh, a lot of, of the older guys from the Civil Rights Movement to come in and 
give presentations, introduce him, and tell funny jokes about various things. And then uh, they called him, they named him an honor <coughs> honorary Negro. So, <laughs> so I'm just saying, I'm, I'm glad to be here and uh, glad to see all of you. And uh, thank God for Lyndon LaRouche. His incarceration, I know, I know everybody. Hold on. His incarceration earned him that designation. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I know it's getting late. I know everybody's anxious to move on. A couple of questions. One, how do you avoid the FBI from locking you up for lying? Do you just remain silent? You have the right to remain silent. You don't have to answer their no, questions. No, no, but I've got the goods on them, so they don't bother me. <laughs> They, but I, I just, I know you're, you've been in the game for a while, so we're, we're, I'm relatively new. How, is it really, if somebody from the FBI asks you a question, the best thing to do is, I'm not talking, that's it? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, it is. The other thing so is... They say you need your lawyer present, and that'll yeah. end it. So, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Philip McManus. I'm the president of the Rockaway Republican Club in Queens. <clears throat> I'm a big supporter of Trump, and I'm absolutely all about pro-life, pro-life. I think what we need to do in this country is to remind people of, you know, sure. certain laws, law and order. And one of those is the Ten Commandments. I live by the Ten Commandments as best as I can, all right? We shouldn't steal, we shouldn't lie, and we certainly shouldn't murder people. Especially when we all started, we all started where? conception in the womb, kids. and we must protect that. We, we fought slavery, and we didn't half-ass slavery. We did what we had to do because it was morally right. Excuse me, yes. what is we're gonna do for you? Yeah. Uh, first of all, we're coming up on time, we've only got four minutes, Sorry. and hold, hold on, stay right there. Uh, the speakers will be moving out into the hallway almost immediately, so you will be able to have other discussion with people. But Dennis, who is one of the people who, together with Lyndon LaRouche, went to jail and for several years is going to respond to you about your concern. Thank you. Uh, one thing before you start. I, I really believe that we need to have absolute truths and reality. I think the problem now is we have rel radical relativism. We need to fight for truth. And I just want to bring that up, that that's what we need to do for our country. Sometimes you can't avoid going to jail. And the only way, and sometimes it's worth it, um, the only way to deal with this issue is to defeat the enemy. You can't hide, you can't be smart, quote unquote, you can't lawyer up. That's a large part of the problem, lawyering up. <laughs> The enemy has to be defeated. The people behind the frame-ups and the setups have got to be destroyed. The British Empire has got to be destroyed. And if sometimes it takes going jail to jail to do that, so be it. Some people, Martin Luther King and others, gave their lives. The question is, is the cause, are the ideas, is that for which you're fighting worth dedicating your entire life to doing or not? And that's the individual decision which every single person in this room has to make. So don't start from the standpoint of how do I avoid going to jail. Start from the standpoint of how do we destroy the enemy to free the entirety of humanity. We've got seven billion people to worry about. Patrick, you've got 60 seconds. And it's not personal, we only have another minute after that. I'm so. Patrick from Connecticut, and uh, I'm glad to be here with everybody. Uh, Linda LaRue's taught me one thing out of the short time I've known him and the group. Uh, audacious, bold, and extraordinary. And I'm working on something in, in Connecticut and it's called a seminar because I really believe that you have to bring people in to a educational program in order to know what is out there 
And I had uh, the pleasure of having one of our top uh, young scientists uh, come and do a seminar in, uh, in Greenwich, Connecticut. And that was the first of many of these uh, uh, seminars that are going to be taken, uh, you know, being uh, performed. And uh, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, you have to teach the, you have to teach people the truth. Patrick is also raising money in Connecticut. He may have more to say about that <laughs> tomorrow. We advise everybody else to do it. All right, so thank you. So here's the story. We're now ending. We start again at 2.30.